Committee will come to order. A couple of housekeeping matters before we uh, begin. First, we will adjourn the public portion of this hearing at 1 o'clock and uh, immediately move upstairs for the classified portion. Second, as we noticed last week, we will run questions in reverse seniority for those present at the gavel. Uh, we try to do this every year to give uh, our uh, members at the bottom of the dais the opportunity to participate earlier in the process. Yeah. <laughs> That's Someone right. That's right. <laughs> I, I, I've heard many objections. <laughs> Today we kick off our posture hearings with Northcom and Southcom. Uh, I want to thank our witnesses for being here and their service to our country. In recent weeks, the American people saw firsthand uh, that China's aggression knows no geographic boundaries. China's spy balloon violated U.S. sovereignty and challenged U.S. homeland defense. Unfortunately, uh, this sh should come as no surprise. The Chinese Communist Party has long been expanding its influence in North and South America. 25 of the 31 countries in Southcom AOR have welcomed infrastructure investment from the CCP. 21 have formally joined the CCP's Belt and Road Initiative. The CCP is backing projects to build new or operate existing seaports in Brazil, Peru, Ecuador, Jamaica, Argentina, Panama, Mexico, and the Bahamas. This is concerning because the CCP is leveraging these investments to gain strategic footholds in our hemisphere. Many of these countries host ports calls, host port calls, buy military equipment, and receive training from the PLA. Sadly, the number of South and Central American countries willing to enter into partnerships with the CCP is only growing. We need to take, take action to reverse that trend. Unfortunately, the CCP is not only malign, is, it's not the only malign influence in the Western Hemisphere. Russia recently deploys troops to Nicaragua, Venezuela, and continues to prop up Cuba's communist regime. Now even Iran is gaining presence in South America. Just two weeks after President Biden welcomed Brazil's new president to the White House, two Iranian warships were allowed to dock in Rio. We must stop being so complacent about our adversaries growing influence in our hemisphere. We need to do more to build and enhance partnerships in the region. Beyond the growing presence of our adversaries, many areas of South and Central America continue to be havens for transnational criminal organizations. These brutal criminal gangs prey on thousands of vulnerable men, women, and children. They steal their money, and endanger their lives with perilous attempts to gain illegal entry uh, at our borders. They also, uh, they're also the main source of fentanyl and other dangerous drugs smuggled across our border. We are seeing the consequences on streets across America. Over 100,000 are dying each year from fentanyl overdoses alone. At our southern border, a record 2.7 million mil uh, migrants illegally crossed into our country in 2022. That blew away the previous record by over one million individuals. Communities in our border states and throughout the country are struggling as a result. Northcom and Southcom are doing their best to provide support to civilian authorities to address the border crisis, but the real solution rests with our president. He needs to stop with the excuses and secure our border. Finally, I'm very concerned about the Secretary's decision to go along with the Commerce Department's plan that will lead to the auctioning off of critical DOD spectrum. This spectrum is used for the vast majority of our military radar systems, including our early warning homeland and shipborne missile defense. I'm having a lot of trouble understanding the rationale for his decision. Especially when Russia has suspended the New START Treaty, North Korea is launching more ICBMs, and China is sending hypersonics around the globe. I expect the DOD to explain this to this committee how it is in our national security interest to auction off this vital spectrum. I look forward to hearing from our witnesses and getting their best military advice on how to overcome the security challenges we face. And with that, I yield to my friend, the ranking member, Mr. Smith. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate it. And I want to welcome our, our witnesses, General Van Herk, General Richardson, and Ms. Dalton. Appreciate your leadership and appreciate you being before us today. I think the chairman laid out you know, a pretty good analysis of the threats that we face uh, in you two AORs, and I uh, just want to agree with that. Um, starting with in the North American domain, uh, as General Van Herk 
put it, the domain awareness issues are, are significant. We, we need to know what's coming at us. We need to be able to see um, what the threats are. And certainly publicly, we saw what the threats could be um, at high altitude from apparently balloons. Uh, but some of the bigger threats are cyber. Do we know how well protected our systems are? So when it comes to protecting to the homeland, that's where it starts. Are we aware of the threats that are coming at us in all possible domains? And this is not an easy thing. Uh, we certainly have radars. We have systems to pick up on things coming at us. But those radars can't see everything all the time. How do we prioritize or how do we improve the system so that they can see more? It seems like the Chinese became aware of a vulnerability that slow-moving objects at high altitude were things that we tended not to see. Well, well, now we are seeing them. But we'll look forward to a further explanation of how we can make sure that we have a robust domain awareness. And again, even though it was very much in, in TD about the, the objects moving across our airspace, the, the real threat is in the cyber domain. And the real threat is whether or not we can make sure we protect our systems. So I would appreciate an update on how we can make sure we do that. And this certainly, I think the chairman emphasized exactly the point that, that we are you know, becoming aware of. And that is Russia, China, and Iran are incredibly active um, in the Western Hemisphere. Um, they are building relationships throughout Latin America. We need to better understand that and figure out how to deal with it. Um, it, is, it is a challenge that we had not seen uh, for, for a while, but it's very much present and that we need to be aware of and need to be ready to deal with. And I look forward to General Richardson explaining to us a little bit more about how we're doing that. And then lastly, of course, the issue of transnational criminal organizations engaged in drug and human trafficking, an enormous problem, which we're all very much aware of, um, that we need to better understand how that threat is coming, again, from your AOR, and how we can better deal with it. Uh, again, I look forward to the testimony and the questions from our panel, and I yield back. Thank the ranking member. Now I'd like to introduce our witnesses. The Honorable Melissa Dalton is the Assistant Secretary of Defense for Homeland Defense and uh, Hemispheric Affairs. She previously served as the Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for, strategic, for Strategy Plans and Capabilities. General, General Glenn Van Herc is the Commander of the United States Northern Command and Northern American Airspace Defense Command. He previously served as the director of the Joint Staff. General Laura Richardson is the commander of the United States Southern Command and previously served as the commanding general of the U.S. Army North. I welcome our witnesses. And Ms. Dalton, we'll start with you for five minutes. Chairman Rogers, Ranking Member Smith, and distinguished members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to testify today. I will highlight how we are putting homeland defense and other interests across this hemisphere front and center to implement the 2022 National Defense Strategy. Per the NDS, the People's Republic of China is the pacing challenge for DOD, while Russia remains an acute threat. In addition to building conventional and nuclear capabilities, we are concerned that the PRC in particular is using non-kinetic means to subvert our ability to project power. The NDS also ensures vigilance of other persistent threats. North Korea is expanding its nuclear and missile capability to threaten the homeland. Iran is testing space launch technologies, and global terrorist groups require continued monitoring. A range of fast-evolving technologies could disrupt U.S. supply chain and logistics operations. For example, small un uncrewed aircraft systems could pose a threat to domestic DOD facilities. Last year, the homeland endured 90 incidents caused by hurricanes, severe storms, wildfires, and floods degrading our readiness. In the Western Hemisphere, these hazards contribute to instability and migration, creating conditions that state and non-state actors can exploit. We are doing more than ever to deter, defend, and defeat aggression from competitors. We're using an integrated deterrence approach to harness conventional cyber, space, and information capabilities to raise costs for our competitors while reducing their expected benefits of aggression. Per the 2022 Missile Defense Review, our missile defense systems offer protection for the U.S. population while reassuring others that we will not be coerced by threats to the homeland. Nested within our missile defense approach, integrated air and missile defense enables freedom of action by negating an adversary's ability to create adverse effects with air and missile capabilities. We also rely on strategic deterrence for large intercontinental range nuclear missile threats from the PRC and Russia. 
Investments in modern sensors and infrastructure are vital to homeland defense against airborne and maritime threats and to our ability to project forces. We are grateful for the committee's support of the over-the-horizon radars. We are working with Canada to maximize NORAD's coverage of the approaches to North America. It is also vital to extend the Secretary's authority under Section 130I of Title 10 to protect certain DOD facilities and domestic assets from UAS. By virtue of U.S. sovereign territory in Alaska, the Arctic is an extension of the U.S. homeland. We are working to implement the national strategy for the Arctic region. We are leveraging the Ted Stevens Center for the Arctic Strategic Studies in Alaska. We demonstrate combat credible forces in the Arctic by training and exercising, including through Arctic Edge with Canada and through bomber task force deployments with the United Kingdom and Norway to support NATO. Our competitors' gray zone activities threaten key domestic assets, networks, and infrastructure that DOD and the American people rely on. DOD is enhancing the resilience of U.S. systems, working within the interagency with federal, state, local, tribal, territorial partners and the private sector. We work the defense ind industrial base to enhance cybersecurity and resilience. To operate through disruption, we are increasing DOD's ability to operate in a more dispersed manner and from alternate locations. Defense Support of Civil Authorities, or DISCA, is an important activity supporting the American public and our partners responding to disasters, public health emergencies, and securing our borders. Today, approximately 2,500 2, military personnel are deployed to the southwest border. DOD has supported DHS's border security mission for 18 of the last 22 years. Per the NDS, DOD is prepared to support DISCA activities that do not impair warfighting readiness. Our domestic partners should be resourced for their mission requirements, preserving DOD's warfighting capabilities. We are also strengthening our ability to withstand and recover from extreme environmental events and to build a resilient joint force. We intend to use the new Defense Operational Resilience International Cooperation Program to build our partners' early warning capabilities to reduce the need for DOD assets for disasters and other emergencies. We are deepening partnerships with Canada, Mexico, Brazil, Colombia, and Chile while reinforcing democratic institutions, civilian control of the military, and respect for human rights and the rule of law. Secretary Austin highlighted the importance of integrated deterrence at last year's Conference of the Defense Ministers of the Americas in Brazil. Later this week, I will travel to Mexico to discuss defense issues. Our relationships in this hemisphere help ensure we are able to conduct humanitarian assistance and disaster relief, bolster cyber defenses, promote climate resilience, and conduct pandemic response. To conclude, the department is committed to defending the homeland and pursuing U.S. interests across this hemisphere. Thank you for support, your support of the Department of Defense, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Ms. Dalton. Chair, and I recognize General Van Herk for five minutes to read his statement. Chairman Rogers, Ranking Member Smith, and distinguished members of the committee, uh, thank you for the opportunity to appear today and represent the men and women of United States Northern Command and the North American Aerospace Defense Command. NORTHCOM and NORAD are distinct commands united by a common purpose, to defend the United States and Canadian homelands in what is clearly the most complex and dynamic strategic environment that I have experienced during more than 35 years in service. In my role as the commander of NORTHCOM, I'm responsible for homeland defense, defense support of civil authorities in the United States, and security cooperation with our military partners in Canada, Mexico, and the Bahamas. As the commander of NORAD, the unique U.S.-Canadian Binational Command, I'm responsible for aerospace warning, aerospace control, and maritime warning in the approaches to North America. Despite the complexity of the strategic environment, and recent erosion of military advantage, the United States military remains the most powerful and professional force in history. However, we must take action now to stop the erosion of our military advantage. Our competitors' actions and ambitions are global and all domain in nature, and our competitors have the capability and intent to hold our homeland at risk, above and below the nuclear threshold and in multiple domains, to achieve their strategic objectives. The PRC and Russia have fielded cruise missiles, delivery platforms, non-kinetic capabilities that hold at risk critical infrastructure and civilian infrastructure in the United States and Canada, and with the capability to strike with limited warning with significant consequences, including reducing our capability to project power from a secure homeland. Limited warning due to a lack of all domain awareness inherently limits the risk and decision space options available to national leaders which increases the risk of miscalculation and escalation. Today I assess, as I have for nearly three years, that the homeland 
is a potential limiting factor to ensuring rapid and effective implementation and execution of global contingency plans due to my lack of domain awareness, timely access to forces that are ready to operate throughout my area of responsibility, including in the Arctic, and a lack of resilient infrastructure enabling the Joint Force to fight in and from our homeland while ensuring forward power projection. To address today's strategic environment, for nearly three years, I have focused on four key priorities. Domain awareness, or the ability to see and detect potential threats in all domains. Information dominance, which is the use of artificial intelligence and machine learning to process data more rapidly for strategic advantage. Decision superiority, which is the dissemination of data and information to the right leader at the right time from the tactical to the strategic level. And finally, global, global integration, addressing today's environment with a global and all domain approach, vice legacy, regional approaches, and practices. Those priorities are critical to successfully defending the homeland and to providing our national leaders with the only thing I can never give them enough of, and that's time, to create deterrence options and, if required, defend and defeat options. Our competitors' actions over the last several years have shown that regional crises often take the department uh, to have global implica implications which the, and also the potential for rapid escalation. In this uh, vital that the department adopt globally integrated plans and policies that fully reflect competitor capability, capacity, and intent, including the intent to threaten our homeland. While we have work to do, there has been some notable progress towards the key priorities. I'm grateful to the department and Congress for your support of the over the horizon radars that will significantly improve domain awareness and the ability to detect and track threats well before they reach North America. But we need to go faster. An acquisition plan based on over a decade is too long. Both the Department of Defense and the Canadian Department of National Defense have committed to funding over the horizon radar. And I respectfully urge both governments to ensure this vital and proven capability is fielded as quickly as possible. Likewise, the Space Force's investment in advanced space-based missile warning sensor capabilities and the Navy's commitment to modernizing integrated undersea surveillance are vital to my homeland defense mission. Yet again, we can't wait a decade or longer to field these capabilities. Our commands and the Department of Defense need your continued support to outpace the rapid gains made by our competitors. Continued progress will require the Department and Congress to accept some risk by prioritizing rapid modernization and innovation over maintaining obsolete platforms, organizations, and infrastructure, and occasionally accept failure as part of the process. The generational challenges ahead of us will require the best minds and expertise we can find. The Department also must vest, invest accordingly in civilian and military personnel recruiting, hiring, and retention. And we must continue to build the enormous advantage in working with our international alliances and partnerships. I believe the greatest risk that our nation faces right now is our inability to change and adapt at a pace required by the strategic environment. Homeland defense must be recognized as essential to contingency plans at home and for power projection abroad, and it is vital that all military planning account for that reality. In an area of incredible innovation and technological advancement, inflexible, outdated processes are a greater impediment to success than many of our competitors' advancements. Finally, I'd like to comment on recent events, including the incursion of the PRC high-altitude balloon into our national airspace. The PRC high-altitude balloon was obviously a significant event that shined light on PRC's brazen intelligence collection against the United States and Canada. It was the first time in NORTHCOM's history we conducted an engagement over the United States, and it made clear that our competitors have the capability and intent to reach our homeland also clearly demonstrates the limitations of our domain awareness and the impediments we face in getting information into the hands of decision makers quickly. Candidly, the internal discord of this event caused, just showed that one of the ways our competitors target us each and every day in the information space, and they're becoming increasingly adept at driving wedges between the American people. As for NORAD and NORTHCOM, I commit to you that this event has already generated critical lessons for my commands and our mission partners, and I can guarantee you that both NORAD and NORTHCOM are going to continue to learn and do whatever is necessary to keep our country safe. On behalf of all the soldiers, sailors, airmen, Marines, guardians, and civilians at NORAD and NORTHCOM, I'd like to thank the committee for your steadfast support as we defend our nation. I look forward to your questions. Thank you, General. Chair now recognizes General Richardson for five minutes for her opening statement. Chairman Rogers, Ranking Member Smith, and distinguished members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to appear before you today. 
with Assistant Secretary Dalton, General Van Herc, who are my teammates in keeping this Western Hemisphere safe. I'm honored to represent the men and women of U.S. Southern Command to discuss the challenges we share in, with our neighbors in Latin America and the Caribbean. As stated in the National Security Strategy, no region impacts the United States more directly than the Western Hemisphere. Last year, I testified before the committee and stated this region, our shared neighborhood, is under assault from a host of cross-cutting transboundary challenges that directly threaten our homeland. This is still true today and is a call to action. In the last year, I've spent traveling in the region, meeting with leaders to better understand these challenges and the threat they pose to our mutual interests. The world is at an inflection point. Our partners in the Western Hemisphere with whom we are bonded by trade, shared values, democratic traditions, family ties, are feeling the impacts of external interference and coercion. The People's Republic of China, our pacing challenge, continues to expand its economic, diplomatic, technological, informational, and military influence in Latin America and the Caribbean. The PRC has the capability and intent to eschew international norms, advance its, its brand of authoritarianism, and amass power and influence at the expense of these democracies. The PRC has expanded its ability to extract resources, establish ports, manipulate governments through predatory investment practices, and build potential dual-use space facilities, the most space facilities in any combatant command region. Russia, an acute threat, bolsters authoritarian regimes in Cuba, Nicaragua, and Venezuela, and continues its extensive disinformation campaign. These activities undermine democracies and challenge our credibility. Both China and Russia exploit the presence of transnational criminal organizations and amplify their destabilizing impact on democratic governments. TCOs spread violence and corruption throughout the region and beyond. Their fentanyl-laced cocaine contributes to the deaths of Americans in cities and towns across the country. The good news is, is that working with our very willing partners leads to the best defense, and we must use all available levers to strengthen our partnerships with the 28 like-minded democracies in this hemisphere who understand the power of working together to counter these shared challenges. Our partners look to us to lead in the hemisphere. We have an obligation to meet them where they are and commit to aggressively address our common security challenges. We must continue to maximize the effectiveness of important tools like security cooperation, programs to train and equip our partner militaries and public security forces, and conduct multilateral exercises to build interoperability and to increase the State Department's international military education and training, foreign military financing, and foreign military sales programs to educate, train, and build the capacity that our partners put to immediate use to stand shoulder to shoulder with us. As the National Defense Strategy states, the U.S. derives immense benefits from a stable, peaceful, and democratic Western Hemisphere that reduces security threats to our homeland. U.S. Southcom is putting integrated deterrence into action every day, using innovative methods to work seamlessly across all domains with the other combatant commands, the Joint Force, allies and partners, Congress, the U.S. interagency, NGOs, and the private sector to help build a hemisphere that's free, secure, and prosperous for our generation and generations to come. I call this team democracy, and we need to build and field a resource team. Thank you, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Chair. Recognizes himself. General Van Herc, can you speak to the importance of the DOD's current spectrum to radar, sensor, and interceptor systems, and uh, the risks of losing that spectrum would pose to Homeland Defense capabilities? Yeah, Chairman. So. Uh, the specific frequencies you're talking about, multiple DOD platforms uh, operate in that to include uh, some of our maritime homeland defense capabilities. 
and our airborne uh, capabilities to detect uh, threats here in the homeland. I think going forward, the best way to, to look at this is make sure that we understand exactly the impact of national security and homeland defense and the broader uh, impact of any sell-off of those uh, capabilities or the frequencies uh, going forward. So if you lost access to those, that spectrum, would it have an adverse impact on your capability to defend the homeland? Chairman, it absolutely could have an impact to those capabilities, uh, maritime uh, homeland defense radar capabilities, along with airborne capabilities. Okay. General Ritson, your testimony outlines the extent to um, which China's pervasiveness in the region has taken place in recent years. What tools and resources do you need from this committee to improve partnerships and stop China's gains in the territory? So my main levers uh, to get after the, the problem set and the challenges and help our partners in the region uh, is security cooperation. That is my main lever. That's the training, the equipping, uh, all, also our exercise program. We have eight large exercises. That's the ability to bring, be able to bring over 20 partner nations together uh, to train, to work through uh, challenges with translation, interoperability, uh, our doctrine, our tactics, all those kinds of things. Uh, that's one thing that PRC cannot do, is bring nations together to conduct exercises. So a very, very powerful program. But the security cooperation, um, we, we got to be there with our partners on the field, with our jersey on, uh, with the, uh, the training and the equipping that we bring to make them stronger. Their challenges and their security challenges are our security challenges. They turn right around and put the security cooperation to use in order to, to counter those challenges so they don't end up north and on our southwest border. Chair, and I recognize the ranking member for any questions he may have. Thank you. Uh, General Van Herc, on the domain awareness issue, which I, I did not explain as clearly as I would have liked to in my opening statement, but what, what do we need to do to make sure that we are aware of the threats that are coming at us in our airspace and in cyberspace? Uh, what, what are the most important steps? And I, I'm assuming that you believe there is a vulnerability there and we need to do more to protect ourselves from it. Yeah, Ranking Member Smith, absolutely there is a vulnerability there. The first thing I would say is field as soon as possible the over-the-horizon capabilities the Department has already funded in last year's budget. So we need to go faster. Same thing with NORAD and the Canadians. We need to field those capabilities. Right now we employ a legacy 1980s, 80s Cold War era system. We need to ensure that the radars besides over-the-horizon radars, such as our FPS 117s that we have, are fully modernized and integrated with the Federal Aviation and also DOD and other domain awareness capabilities. Uh, I'm grateful for the funding for undersea surveillance uh, with the IUSS. Uh, I think we need to go forward modernizing that, though in the Pacific it'll be different than what we do in the Atlantic due to the vast reaches. So in the Pacific, I think uh, laying cable on the Pacific will be a challenge. We need to get more mobile capabilities and also consider uh, going to space-based kind of capabilities for that. And finally, uh, the cyber is the most concerning for me, uh, Ranking Member Smith, candidly. We don't know what we don't know. And many of the cyber uh, threats operate outside of DOD authority and also federal authorities such as CISA with Jen Easterly. And that creates a vulnerability. I rely on municipalities, industry, commercial uh, capabilities to project power from our homeland and defend our homeland. We need to make sure we understand those vulnerabilities. Yeah, and I think that that's something this committee really should prioritize as we're looking at the authorities and the systems that we need to fund. I mean, a lot of it's just a matter of upgrading what we have. I mean, we've, we've got, had a lot of great systems, but they've been around a long time. Uh, we haven't upgraded as technology has moved forward, enabling us to better protect ourselves. So I think we really need to focus on that. Yes, sir. Can I add one thing? I think it's crucial to point out that the FISA, the 702 authorities expire later this year. Those authorities have been crucial for us maintaining awareness on potential threats to our homeland and around the globe. And uh, I, I would tell you that uh, allowing that to expire could increase the threat to the homeland. That's a very fair point. And the spectrum issue is also, also a challenge, as the chairman alluded to. I mean, part of the reason on the spectrum is we're, we're, we're trying to keep up on the commercial side. And I think everyone here would agree that in terms of our national security, the degree to which the U.S. can be the leader um, in communications technology and make sure that we have access um, to that spectrum, even on the private side, is important. We just have to figure out how to do it in a way that doesn't jeopardize our national security interests. And I've been, been 
flailing away at that issue for a while. It's not an easy balance to strike, but it is one we need to pay attention to. General Richardson, we've talked about China, Russia, and Iran. Um, just in a nutshell, why, why are we, we struggling so much on that with some of our Latin American countries? When you and I met, we talked a little bit about how Brazil is basically cozying up to Russia and a number of other countries down there as well. What, what is it that Russia and China are bringing to the game down there that is making these countries so willing uh, to, to, to embrace them? And what can we do to get a, get a better balance there? And understanding that we're not going to keep China or even Russia um, out of Latin America, but how can we make sure it doesn't jeopardize our national security interests? Um, thank you for the question. The, uh, I think the, just to uh, go back a couple of years into COVID and, uh, and create a, a picture of the landscape, I think COVID has have, had a devastating impact, um, uh, more proportional than 8% uh, of the world's population in this region. They suffered 29% of the world's COVID deaths. 170 million put into, uh, people in this region put into poverty. Their economies are struggling. And so as they're trying to dig out of the hole, all of them, uh, and you have the, the PRC showing up with the Belt and Road Initiative, the billions of dollars uh, uh, that they uh, advertise available for these big projects, all these projects that they do, highways, electrical dams, um, and it looks like investment, but it's all in critical infrastructure, uh, amazingly enough, in space, in telecommunications, in deep water ports. One has to ask themselves why. Why with the largest military buildup on conventional nuclear forces in mainland China, are they invest investing, looks to be investing, across the globe in Latin America and the Caribbean? And so th this is very concerning. And I would say because of the, the status and the, uh, of the economies of these countries, is that they have to look uh, at whatever they can get their hands on to deliver for their people. Uh, the leaders in the region are in there for a short period of time, generally one term, and that's about four years. They've got Th four thank years to Thank deliver. you. I apologize. I'm, I'm out of time. Yield back. Thank, thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Assistant Secretary Dalton, General Van Herc, and General Richardson, I have to say, General Richardson, you're probably one of the first to actually, in my opinion, properly address what China and Russia's real desire is there in Latin America. For a long time, I've been talking about this geopolitical alignment for many years on Russia, China, Iran, and North Korea. This Road and Belt Initiative Chairman Xi has launched, which was really an effort to try and expand out the Eurasian borders, take Africa, take Oceania, take over the portage and railways, creating almost a maritime silk route that would cut off and choke Western Hemisphere supply chain but also taking over and helping to try and increase tariffs and other things through the Panama Canal. And then the Russians actually creating almost a faux iron curtain, utilizing the Chavez in Venezuela, Pedro in Colombia, as well as for utilizing the Darien Gap to print uh, fentanyl by the mainland Chinese to utilize to poison Americans. It nearly seems as if it was an entrapment to try and go ahead and encircle America to choke off Western Hemisphere supply chain, because what we're really facing is the economic resource cyber warfare against China and his uh, malign activities. So in knowing this, what exactly is NORTHCOM and SOUTHCOM doing to work on countering this additional ground that China is gaining within Latin America? So the, I'll go back to, thank you for the question, Congressman. I'll go back to my uh, main levers, and that's security cooperation for SOUTHCOM, uh, also the exercises. And then in my opening statement, talking about the education, the foreign military financing, foreign military sales. It's crucial uh, to help them uh, achieve and uh, obtain uh, the, the hardware that they need in order to counter uh, the malign activity. The ISR to be able to see, the domain awareness to see the threats is really important. There are a lot of legacy systems that are out there that our partners have, radar systems, and they need to be advanced. But the thing is, is uh, as, uh, as I said earlier, our partners are our best defense. And working with them, everything that we do with security cooperation is based in the human rights, the rule of law, the professionalization of their militaries. And we've seen over the past few years um, the challenges that they've had, but how they have maintained a professional military. Really, really proud of them. But the security cooperation is really uh, important for us. And 
kind of staying on topic and realizing that China has continued to utilize economic coercion as opposed to kind of the U.S.'s cash diplomacy efforts, how do you see a way that we can combat what they're doing from an economic perspective that would enable us to weaken them in that area? So uh, in terms of from the military side, that's uh, being able to deliver in that short period of time. Those leaders are in the seat for like four years. They're on a stopwatch. They're not on the calendar. They're trying to deliver in three to six months. Our, uh, our foreign military sales is really built for long term, so we're really trying hard, and uh, Secretary Dalton has been uh, very helpful in that. Speeding up those processes, working with the interagency, within our own Department of Defense to speed those up, because our partners do see how quickly that uh, we can get equipment to Ukraine. So we've got to be able to not take two and three years to get one coastal patrol vessel or one maritime patrol aircraft, uh, a King Air 250, to a country to help them be able to see and counter the malign activity. And we can do it. We can compete with the PRC. We don't have to outspend them to compete with them. But we got to meet our partners' needs where they need it. And a little goes a long way in this region. We talk about some of the older equipment that we utilize and the importance of ISR capabilities in these areas. And I recently visited uh, Florida Atlantic University who's working a lot on quantum linkage and as well as for AI autonomous drone capabilities and capacities. Do you feel that, and, and this is a concern obviously that Chairman Xi has as well because he has said that he's outpacing us militarily and economically, but innovation is really the area that he needs to pick things up. Do you think getting those types of innovations into the field and into the hands of the military would actually help us in being able to combat some of these efforts? Absolutely. And so I advertise the, the Southcom region as an area. Bring your tools uh, for innovation, laboratory tests, whatever you want to do. We'll put it to real world use and a real world mission. Get hands on in the military, be able to use it, test it. Uh, see what works, what doesn't work. Uh, and we've been pretty successful with that, but I advertise that to all of the services. And, uh, and we have a lot of folks that are really taking advantage of that. Thank you so much. With that, I yield my time back. Gentleman from Texas, Mr. Vesey is recognized for five minutes. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, thank you uh, very much. Uh, Secretary Dalton, uh, General Richardson noted in her testimony uh, that China's trade footprint in Latin America and the Caribbean is going to increase by about 4,000% uh, by 2025. I was curious uh, how the department uh, is part of the response uh, to address PRC's expanding uh, influence in the region. Congressman, thank you for, for the question. And um, it is deeply concerning uh, the trend lines in, in the region. And it reflects, I think, this broader approach by, by the PRC um, leveraging all tools of its national power to extend its reach really globally and, and to compete with the United States. Um, that comes through gray zone tactics. It comes through economic linkages in the Caribbean and Latin America, as, as you noted. In terms of what DOD is doing, um, I think General Richardson's um, lay down of the security cooperation levers that, that we have um, is, is quite right. Um, the, our ability to bolster our defense relationships, empower the, the leaders um, that are aligned with our interests and values um, in the region, and accelerate our, our security cooperation activities to them um, will enhance our relationships and crowd out the possibilities uh, for, for the PRC to make further inroads. I do think there's also more that we could be doing in the region, building upon great work that Southcom is already doing to expand expose the predatory nature of some of the PRC's activities um, through information operations and, and public affairs. Thank you very much. Um, I wanted to ask General Van Herk a, a question on China also. Uh, when the previous administration put in trade restrictions uh, on China, uh, one of the things that the Chinese did was that they just upped their investment in Mexico, uh, one of our NAFTA trade-in partners. As a matter of fact, uh, uh, we saw record high investment uh, in Mexico uh, around 2020, 2021 time period. And the DEA is saying that China is still the primary source of fentanyl and fentanyl-related uh, substances that come into the United States. Uh, can you talk a little bit about uh, as trade continues to increase with our partners to the South, particularly Mexico, uh, how important it is that we get a hold of this? 
So make sure I understand your question. Get a hold of uh, the, the Chinese investment. Not the, the how, how concerned should we be about the Chinese investment and uh, and there and it being correlated with them uh, being in control of so much fentanyl coming into the United States? Yeah, we we should be very concerned about Chinese investment in the entire Western Hemisphere, not only in Mexico. Uh, there's significant Chinese in, uh, investment in Mexico. About 80 percent of their telecommunications is provided by Chinese companies such as Huawei. Their border detection and their security uh, going back and forth. We work closely with Mexico to ensure the Chinese aren't allowed to uh, provide, uh, you know, the, the capabilities that uh, look at vehicles and processing uh, go across the border as well. As far as the fentanyl piece, let, let's, let's be clear. When we say China, it comes from individuals and companies in China, but the PRC themselves is turning a blind eye. So it's crucial that we uh, expose that. We, we name and shame their activities, the fact that they aren't taking advantage of uh, stopping that, and we shouldn't expect them to, but we should do more. It's coming not only from China, but other places in Asia as well, and we need to work closely. I'm working very closely with Samar. They've been charged, uh, Samar is the, the Secretary of Samar, the Navy uh, in Mexico, and providing information to enable them to basically go after some of these precursors as they provide port security. I'd also expand that it's not just in Mexico and uh, the Western Hemisphere and Latin America, it's in the Bahamas as well. And so they have the largest uh, mega resort built right on top of our Navy's uh, test and training ranges and where our cables come ashore. So things that we could do is we have to continue to educate, declassify, and let these nations see what's actually going on as well and continue building their relationships. It would vastly help to have an ambassador in the Bahamas. We haven't had one since 2011. Yeah, no, thank you very much. General Richardson, uh, in, in short, um, but, you know, based on that, what sort of platform should we be investing in for the future, particularly now that we know that China is going to continue to uh, uh, want to have this large footprint in uh, uh, the in, in our southern hemisphere. So I think the uh, the challenges that our uh, that our uh, countries face in the region is the cyber is at the at the top of their list of the challenges that they're dealing with. Ransomware attacks, cyber attacks, are very very prevalent, and building their capacity and capability to. Um, one, harden their networks and be able to do that very, very quickly uh, and harden critical infrastructure and having uh, uh, the ability to be able to do that. And again, I go back to the, the struggling economies of some of these countries are having a hard time doing that. So we're, we're uh, helping them to identify the, uh, their vulnerabilities uh, in order to uh, put a focus on that and be able to, to fix that. Gentlemen, thank you. Expired. Chair, I recognize the gentleman from Missouri, Mr. Alford, for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman Rogers, Ranking Member Smith, and our witnesses here today. Proud to say that both of our generals today are Missouri natives. Thank you for being here today. I, too, am increasingly concerned about the threat China poses, not just in the Indo-Pacific region, but us here at home, here in America. With a recent Chinese spy balloon flying over the U.S. homeland, China's surveillance of America and through TikTok on their, on their phones, uh, new reports of Chinese-made cranes operating at American ports, including cranes used by our own military being used for surveillance by the CCP. It makes me wonder what part, what part of our society, what part of our, our country, our, our precious nation has not been infiltrated by the Chinese Communist government. I'm also concerned that we do not have the capabilities in place to protect our homeland from a non-kinetic threat, for example, electromagnetic or cyber attack, and that leads to my first question for General Van Herc. Considering the recent Chinese spy balloon that flew unchecked over most of the continental United States, including near Whiteman Air Force Base. Can you talk a little bit about the resources and capabilities that we do have in place to defend our homeland from non-kinetic attacks such as electromagnetic and cyber attacks? So that, that's a great question, Congressman. As far as uh, resources in place, General Nakasone primarily has the responsibility for DOD and defense from uh, the uh, non-kinetic effects that you're talking about and being aware. As far as uh, being aware of EMP, uh, I would say that's not a specific capability, but more broadly, that's our strategic deterrent that defends against that, any kind of an electromagnetic attack on our homeland. And it's also my capabilities to defend against any platform that may deliver that, such as an airborne platform, a high altitude balloon, which could effectively uh, utilize an EMP attack on our homeland. So I think I have the capabilities to do that. 
uh, if I have the domain awareness to see that uh, more broadly and defend against an EMP kind of threat. As far as specific EMP for DOD facilities and key critical infrastructure, much of that is already hardened from EMP attacks. So the way we uh, deliver our uh, emergency action messages, the way we uh, look at our uh, command and control that is critical to nuclear command and control, much of that is already EMP hardened. Thank you, sir. Another concern I have is that we may not be focusing enough on the Army's domestic role as it relates to NORTHCOM. Can you talk about the Army's role with NORTHCOM? Do you believe that the Army has the resources it needs to support our nation during a federal disaster? Yes, yeah, so I believe that question would be best asked by the Army or to the Army, but uh, my concern is access to forces that are organized, trained, and equipped in a timely manner to conduct both defense support to civil authorities and also defense of the homeland. Uh, I'm the only combatant commander that doesn't have a threshold force day to day uh, to defend my area of responsibility. I have to gain access to that through a request for forces for just in time, and those forces then have to come from somewhere else, either retained by the service or somebody else's O plan. Uh, I'm confident the Army has what they need uh, from a capacity-wise to get to it. My question is access to it. I would also point out that uh, I do have concerns about the Arctic. 52% of my AOR is in the Arctic, okay? And we need to ensure that forces are organized, trained, and equipped to operate day-to-day -day in the Arctic. And I'm, I'm less confident there that the services are organized. They all have strategies. They have not funded those strategies. I look forward to seeing the budget for 24. So do we. Thank you. Uh, our last question for you, General, could you please explain what NORTHCOM is doing to counter Huawei? You mentioned their involvement uh, in Mexico. We know that the Chinese Communist government has their tentacles spread throughout with Huawei and ZTE hardware, uh, in particular near military installations. Please address that. So work closely with General Nakasone and Jenny Easterly at CISA to address those. And this is uh, an ongoing topic that you see in the media right now. It's about the investment of Chinese corporations, companies, uh, the, the Chinese Communist Party itself into our nation. So this is an education uh, aspect that we have to ensure folks understand the risk as they uh, sell off properties around military installations. Primarily that responsibility would fall outside of my authorities, but I'm significantly uh, working with uh, those who uh, have that responsibility, commerce and others. We had a good conversation in our office yesterday and we talked about the not just domain awareness, but the awareness of the American people, how do we get America to wake up to the actual threat the communist Chinese government poses? Yeah, I, th I think this is an education and understanding. We're so economically intertwined as well with uh, China that it's hard to set policies in place that could have an impact on ourselves. And so we have to understand the threat. We have to be willing to declassify and expose that threat a little bit more so folks fully understand what China is actually trying to do, the PRC. Thank you, General. Thank you to all of our witnesses. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Chair, now recognize the gentleman from California, Mr. Panetta, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Ranking Member, uh, sir, uh, gentle ladies, uh, good, uh, good morning and thank you for being here. Um, I think the chairman did a pretty good job in setting the scene, uh, at least in regards to the question I'm about to post. I'm going to hit you, Mr. Dalton, Ms. Dalton, first. Um, obviously, we've heard about the horrific reports about the killing of two American uh, people and the kidnapping of two more, I guess this group of four that was going down there for a medical procedure. Um, you know, we're hearing about the explosion of, of illicit uh, drug deaths here in our country. We're, talking, we're hearing about people, thousands upon thousands of people just disappearing in Mexico. The Washington Post did an excellent expose about the amount of fentanyl that is coming into uh, our country. And now you're obviously hearing um, more and more public officials, uh, attorney generals, former AG Barr, you're seeing a House resolution, you're seeing, gonna see a Senate bill, I think by Senator Graham, about what we can do to designate cartels as terrorist groups and authorize, quote unquote, select military capabilities. Obviously, Ms. Dalton, there's a lot of policy challenges in regards to this, but I think we understand why people are asking for this based on what we're seeing. If you could go into the, some of the challenges that there could be for this type of policy to be put in place, especially when it comes to Mexico. 
Congressman, uh, thank you very much for the question. And, and first of all, to acknowledge the, the tragedy of the killing of, of Americans over, over the last week. And um, this is, of course, a priority for this administration um, to, to look out for, for the families and um, to ensure that um, the personnel affected um, are, are returned home. Um, and I, I would say, you know, from a policy perspective, certainly concerning the, the levels of violence, um, the flow of irregular migrants um, to our southwest border, um, the prevalence of fentanyl uh, coming through our ports of entry. Um, these are all deeply concerning trend lines, and we need a holistic approach uh, to, to address it, um, not only with, with Mexico, but as discussed um, more upstream in terms of, of the sources, whether that's PRC's connection to fentanyl or um, working closely with partners um, upstream in the region um, as well. I think to, to your question in terms of weighing the, the advantages and disadvantages of some, some of the steps that are under consideration um, in terms of use of force or certain designations, I think we need to th be clear-eyed about what some of the implications might be um, for the lines of cooperation we do have um, with, with Mexico. And I'll speak from a defense perspective as that's um, my, my primary line of, of oversight. Um, so I'm, I'm going down to, to Mexico actually tonight um, to engage uh, Mexican partners on um, intelligence cooperation, cyber cooperation, a whole host of critical defense cooperation activities. Um, they're important from a national security perspective. And I do worry um, based on um, you know, signals, very strong signals we've gotten from the Mexicans in the past, um, concerns about their sovereignty, concerns about uh, potential reciprocal steps that they might take uh, to cut off our, our access um, if we were to take um, some of the steps that are in consideration. So I think we need to be really clear-eyed about um, weighing those, those trade-offs. And I, I, at least it's planned that I'll be in Mexico as well next week uh, speaking with the president. And obviously, you know, you had a uh, Wall Street Journal uh, editorial, excuse me, op-ed uh, recently that said basically the chief enabler is President Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador. Would you agree with that statement? I believe these are really complex challenges that are going to require engagement um, at all levels uh, to include uh, with, with the head of state. Okay. Um, and you know there there is cooperation that we need to further um, when it comes to counter drug efforts and countering irregular migration as well. Jack, um, in the last forty seconds, uh, General Van Herc, uh, I realize that there's a lot of discussion about the uh, Chinese surveillance balloon over America. There was also reported and to be assessed by the Pentagon a surveillance balloon over Latin America at the same time. Whatever happened to that? Well, I'll speak for what I know, and General Richards can talk about it. What I understand is the uh, the PRC uh, actually uh, terminated that balloon in the Atlantic Ocean off the east coast of South America. That's what uh, my understanding is. And General Richardson, is that correct? That's what I understand as well, yes. Okay. Thank you. I yield back. Gentlemen's time has expired. Chair, and I recognize gentleman from New York, Mr. Lolota, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, status of forces agreements are the compacts the Department of Defense has in place with friendly foreign nations who host U.S. troops overseas. Among other things, these agreements assure that when deployed U.S. forces are accused of crimes by our allies, our troops are afforded the proper protocols and civil, American civil rights, such as a right to counsel of their choice, an interpreter, a bar against pretrial confinement when accused of a nonviolent crime. And for decades, United States forces have been stationed in and deployed to Japan, one of our greatest allies in the Western Pacific. And our nation's military cooperation has been a strong source of stability for the Western Pacific in, uh, in the face of real threats from China and North Korea. Also for decades, military men and women stationed in and deployed to Japan have operated with the understanding that if they were accused of a nonviolent crime in Japan, they would be afforded basic civil rights. Contrary to that understanding, Ridge Alconis, a United States Navy surface warfare officer stationed in Japan, subsequent to being involved in a vehicular accident where everybody agrees no drugs or alcohol was involved, was arrested, confined pretrial, denied access to his own attorney, and denied access to a translator. 
and subsequent to the denial of these rights and while sleep deprived, Ridge Alconis was coerced to confessing and, por and forced to personally pay about a million dollars in restitution. Ridge Alconis is now serving a three-year sentence in a Japanese jail. General Richardson, you command forces in and around 32 uh, different nations, and General Van Herc, um, your command reaches three, four nations from what I understand. Can you each describe the importance of valid and enforceable status of forces agreements, and what does the lack of um, them do, especially with respect to operationally and otherwise, for our forces' morale and effectiveness? So thank you for the question. Uh, I think it's very important, and for uh, the few countries- Would you pull the mic a little bit closer? We can't hear yes, you. Yes, sir. So very important the, uh, uh, in terms of the, the status of forces agreements. And for the few countries that, uh, that don't have the, the SOFA in place yet, uh, that is uh, one of the first things that, that I bring up when I meet with the leaders when I travel to the region. And so, and explaining the importance of it and what it really means, right? I, I think that in some cases that is not fully understood. And so being able to describe it and explain it helps a lot. And uh, 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 so much so that that enables um, then, uh, we've had a, a couple um, cases where we've been able to get that uh, across the goal line, as I would say, where we've got, been able to get a SOFA put in place that wasn't there previously. Thank you. Yeah, it, it's uh, crucial to have a, a good SOFA in place. We just have a new one in Bahamas put in place. Uh, without that, our folks are at risk serving there to what we'd expect for due process here in the United States as well. And this puts us in a common place to negotiate when we start uh, with any country where we're serving, uh, have a foundation going forward when there's instances as you described. And General Richards, of the 32 uh, nations in your AOR, about how many do you not have status of forces agreements with? So uh, the exact number I will get to you for sure, but it's uh, we have more than we don't. And so, uh, and as I said, we will continue to aggressively work that to protect our service members and ensure the countries that, that they know that this isn't just a, a way to, uh, you know, uh, uh, allow our service members to be able to do something and then not be held accountable. We hold our, our service members accountable. Uh, when appropriate, and we will take care of that and make sure that that happens. And so that education piece is really important. Thank you. And uh, Ms. Dalton, uh, what is the Department of Defense doing to get a valid and enforceable status of forces agreement in place with Japan so that our troops can operate with the confidence they deserve? Congressman, thank you for the question. I'll have to take that back uh, to our team that, that works the Indo-Pacific. Thank you. Ms. Dalton, will you commit to bringing this issue to Secretary Austin and uh, express to him how important this committee thinks it is? I will. Thank you. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Chair, now recognize the gentlelady from Alabama, Ms. Sewell, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I want to thank all of our witnesses. I'm particularly concerned about the People's Republic of China's Belt and Road Initiative and their footprint in South America in particular. 21 of the 31 countries within Southcom's area of responsibility have Belt and Road um, projects in their countries. Moreover, China has become South America's top trading partner. While the United States spends our time decoupling our defense industrial supply chains from China. I think we also have to think about how our allies and neighbors in the Western Hemisphere are responding to this Belt and Road Initiative. In fact, I have a bill uh, called the Leveling the Playing Field Act, which would counter the uh, PRC's cross-border subsidies and other anti-free market economic tools, which are at the core of the Belt and, um, and Road Initiative. Ultimately, I believe we have to take a holistic approach to deepening our military, economic, and humanitarian ties uh, in the Western Hemisphere. General Richardson, in your testimony, you discussed how the PRC's use of the Belt and Road Initiative to promote trade and investment in South America. Can you talk a little bit more about how that is being used to undermine existing um, and emerging democracies in, in South America, and what our, our approach should be um, with respect to that, and, and how should we all as lawmakers view this threat? So it's definitely a threat. It's all the instruments of national power that are coming to bear that the PRC brings to the table. 
And I think that uh, with Team USA, we have a lot of investment. We have a lot of things that are uh, happening in this region and in this, uh, in this area of responsibility, the AOR. And I think that we've got to, um, we've got to show that. We've got to showcase that because there's a lot happening, but we need to put Team USA's flag on everything that we do, and we don't. Absolutely. But do you think that these countries actually understand, um, like, for example, in Africa, that uh, the PRC is using their um, Belt and Road Initiative to actually have state-owned uh, state enterprises in right. their ports running military operations? And so I, I want to know, under, I want to understand, I know that these countries have, have um, serious um, economic problems um, that the Chinese prey on, but do they understand the magnitude of allowing their, um, those projects to go on in their country? I think that they understand, but they're desperate. They're desperate for uh, their economies. They're struggling to deliver in a short period of time, and uh, they can't make up the difference and dig out of the hole fast enough. Right. And so when there's nothing else available, uh, we don't have Western or international investment or uh, bidders on the tenders that come out when there are big projects for the critical infrastructure and there are only uh, PRC and Chinese bidders for those tenders. They've got no choice. And so I think that we've got to, uh, we've got to pay more attention to this region. The proximity matters. They are on the 20-yard line of our homeland. We Absolutely. are in a neighborhood. These are our neighbors. And we have got to pay attention to them. I know that like we have we... America's Partnership for Economic Prosperity, mm -hmm. um, and it has a lot of initiatives on that, and I fully support that. In my time remaining, I wanted to talk to um, General uh, Van Ark about the 702 authorities. I sat on the... Um, the Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence for eight years, and I uh, grew to understand the importance of the 702 authorities. I do know that the average American hears about warrantless surveillance and they get uh, quite concerned about it, but I understand that there are, um, you know, obviously guardwells that are in place to protect American citizens from such surveillance. Can you talk to us as we're embarking upon reauthorizing um, FISA? Yeah, so I'm, I'm very confident that the, the Americans uh, society is protected under uh, our right to not have our own people spying on us, okay? And 702 gives us access to foreign entities utilizing U.S. infrastructure for their benefit, which puts our homeland at risk, puts our people at risk. Uh, General Nakasone is, is very, uh, uh, you know, confident that he can maintain the separation of our people's rights along with our national security uh, that uh, FISA 702 gives us. Thank you. And can you talk a little bit about what we have discovered and how we use it to to our own um, homeland, defense of our own, own, own homeland? We should talk about that in a classified environment. I will okay. just tell you that it has <laughs> given us uh, insights into potential attacks on our homeland or intent by personnel to attack our homeland. Thank you very much. I yield back the rest of my time. I thank the gentlelady. The chair, and I recognize the gentlelady from Virginia, Ms. Kiggins, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you so much to the three of you for being here with us today and educating us. Over the past decade, we've seen our world become more unsafe and our adversaries are becoming more aggressive and assertive. And we see Russia's you know, actions in the Ukraine and we know that China is waiting and watching with Taiwan and we see China's behavior specifically be more aggressive, like you all have mentioned, on, on creating civilian ports and not, o not only growing their navy, but on the economic and civilian side as well. Uh, they are in places such as important chokeholds in Djibouti, and now we're seeing them you know, spread to the Atlantic side of, of the Horn of Africa. So, so with your AOR specifically, and General Richardson, if you could address, uh, you know, I know there's deep water ports that have a potential for dual use for China with commercial and military activities, uh, including uh, the both ends of the Panama Canal, and we've seen recent attempts to, to for Chinese securing those rights to build maritime installations in southern Argentina which would provide China with direct access to the Straits of Magellan and Antarctica. So given the strategic location of those two sites, do you have any concerns that in a potential conflict with China, these sites could be militarized by the PRC and limit our ability to reinforce supply lines and move key assets to the Pacific? So the, uh, the Belt and Road Initiative and all of the uh, companies, you know, the, uh, that go in, uh, the state-owned enterprises by the PRC uh, that I worry about could become dual use and used for military purposes. And so the five Chinese companies along the Panama Canal, 
Uh, obviously, I need to keep the Panama Canal open, uh, as well as the Strait of Magellan and the Drake Passage. That connects the east and the west, not just for our militaries, but the global economy. We have got to keep those things open. And so, uh, yes, I absolutely worry about the, the state-owned enterprises and the dual-use dual nature that they could be used for. And you spoke uh, before about security cooperation and how important those relationships are with especially the, the Southcom, within the Southcom's AOR and the training and equipment that we're providing. Uh, but aside from our defense relationships that we have in this AOR, what else are we doing? Are, is there diplomacy exchanges, you know, economic uh, just partnerships that we're creating? Or what else are we doing and what else can we be doing to strengthen some of the, some of the security cooperation that you spoke of? So, I, uh, as I spoke about earlier, the exercises are really important. I have eight uh, exercises at the Southcom level, and then my five components underneath me, from one from every service, including Special Operations Command, also has uh, several exercises that they do. And so, uh, the resourcing of those exercises is really important because that's what really brings the nations together uh, that, uh, that the PRC can't do. They don't convene exercises. They're not able to uh, bring those, the, that number or that level from the entire region together to work together during exercises. Panamex, uh, Defense of the Panama Canal, we just had that. We have that every other year, and we have over 20 partner nations that participate in that. The Chinese are using our playbook against us. They do all expense paid training to Beijing, uh, professional military education, but they're not able to do the exercises yet. And that's why I think that that's such a crucial, um, uh, important program for us. And so why are we so successful? Is it our reputation? Are we, uh, you know, it, that's, that's disheartening to hear that the Chinese are, are using our playbook, as you said, because I, I think that is, a, that is a concern. Is it just we do well because we are, or what is our strength there that, that we can do even better because we, we're owning that space of, of creating those partnerships? And do they, it's a matter of trust, I'm assuming, and, uh, and reputation, but what else can we do to, to kind of fortify what we're doing right there? I would say also uh, trust is an issue. Um, it becomes an issue when they feel like they've been ignored and we haven't uh, paid attention and looked south enough. I call it south blindness sometimes because we do. We have a lot of things going on east and west right, uh, right now, and we have been. However, they want to make sure that they don't want to be taken for granted. Very, very important countries, sovereign nations, but they are very willing partners. They are our, uh, their first choice to work with as a partner nation is the United States. So it's ours to lose. And, uh, and so I really appreciate Congress's support for that. I appreciate the congressional delegations that go into the region uh, to visit these key leaders when they come to Washington, that, uh, that, they, that you give them time. And I want to really thank you for that, that uh, you see them when they ask for an office call and things like that, because that really matters. A little goes a long way. And so I really appreciate the support. I agree with you. It's the little things that count. So please continue to, to let us help in that regard. And thank you for all you do. I yield you. back. Chair, and I recognize the gentleman from North Carolina, Mr. Davis, for five minutes. Oh, good morning. And thank you so much, Mr. Chair. Thank you to each and every one of you for being here today. And also want to personally thank you for your years of service to our country. Thank you. I'm General Richardson. Um, first question, um, can you please just discuss a little further the PRC's growing space footprint um, in your region and the security implications for the United States? So out of any geographic combatant command, we have the most space enabling infrastructure by the Chinese in this region. And, uh, and the planned uh, space facilities will continue to grow um, from what we see. And I'll be able to talk about that more in the, in the classified setting. But um, out of the, the Chinese have three deep space stations, two are in uh, mainland China, and one is in uh, Argentina, the new Ken space facility. And so um, just the increase, uh, the uh, very aggressive increase in space enabling infrastructure is, uh, is very concerning. The telemetry and tracking, the uplink, downlinks, the ability for the PRC to track their own satellites, but then also the surveillance sites to be able to surveil uh, uh, other partner nations, allies, our own uh, satellites as well, and eventually be able to use that apparatus uh, for targeting is what uh, a concern is. 
Okay, thank you. Let me ask this. Uh, you've shared so many different steps that you're currently taking right now within the region. Um, my question would be, right now, broadly speaking, what's the greatest priority um, regarding any new ways uh, that uh, we should be partnering uh, with our allies and partners um, within the region um, to uh, outcompete our, our strategic competitors and um, to address these transnational challenges. Uh, trans, yep. Right, so they are um, uh, just continuing to some of the new things, all domain, I would say, uh, being able to help them uh, be uh, uh, increase their cap uh, capability and capacity with cyber. Uh, as we talk about space, cyberspace, uh, they're trying to uh, tackle cyber issues, but then when you bring cyberspace into it, all domains, uh, the exercise program to be able to, uh, to um, exercise the interoperability, the communications, the, the ability to talk uh, securely with our partner nations is very important. And so uh, the sharing agreements, uh, uh, we talked about SOFA before, but there are all kinds of intel sharing agreements. We've got to be able with the investment of uh, the PRC into the telecommunications, 5G. Uh, five of our countries have the 5G backbone. 24 have uh, PRC, 3G, or 4G backbone. And I'm sure they'll be offered a discount to upgrade to stay with, uh, with Huawei or ZTE. And so very concerning because we want to be able to continue to share intelligence and share information with our partner nations to make them stronger, to counter the threats that eventually end up in our homeland. Okay, thank you. General um, Van Hurst, I'm concerned about the, I'm sorry, um, you noted in your testimony that the Democratic People's Republic of Korea um, tested more missiles in 2022 than any time in its history, um, prioritizing their military capabilities at the expense of other essential items. Um, can you please discuss the dangers this uh, regime possesses? And um, Assistant Secretary Dalton would also appreciate any insight as well. Thank you. Um, DPRK or North Korea has absolutely continued to develop uh, additional capacity and capability with their uh, ballistic missile and their uh, short-range missile uh, program as well. And we saw far more uh, tests this year than, than any other year in the past. Um, we should take them at their word. They, they say they will use them. Uh, we should ensure that we uh, understand that and we uh, operate as such. Today I remain confident in my ability to defend against a limited attack of, from an ICBM from North Korea on the homeland. Uh, I am concerned going forward based on what we saw in their parade on the 8th of February and what we've seen uh, on their capacity and capability that they could exceed my ability to defend against a limited attack. Thank you and completely agree with General Van Herk's uh, assessment. Um, you know, the NDS makes clear that North Korea is expanding its nuclear and missile capability to threaten the homeland. Um, this is a space that we are watching quite closely and through combination of our strategic nuclear deterrent and our missile defense um, systems through an integrated deterrence approach, um, we are looking to, to meet that challenge. Okay. Thank you. You'll bet. Chair, now recognize the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Latrell, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank the panel for, for coming and speaking in front of us today, and, and generals, thank you for your distinguished service. Uh, General Richard, can you tell us about the IS, ISR capabilities that you have, and um, are they sufficient? And if not, what upgrades can we, can we help you with? So I get about 2% of the, the DOD uh, ISR in U.S. Southcom, and, um, and it meets about 17% of my requirement for the ISR. I want to uh, thank the department and thank Congress for the support of the, uh, the government-owned and contract-operated and the contract-owned and contract-operated ISR that I'm able to get as well um, uh, that helps build uh, that requirement. A little bit more. Uh, domain awareness is really important for the region. It's a really big region. And being able to see the threats, counter the threats, um, also expose the malign activity to our partner nations because when we expose it and say where it is, uh, they, they go right after it. They'll go out with their po coastal patrol vessels to, um, to the semi-submersibles or uh, go-fast vessels uh, that are in the maritime domain, <clears throat> excuse me, to counter that. And so 
but the ISR is critical and the domain awareness is critical. And so uh, we don't have, as I said, 17% of the requirement. 17%? Right. Where's your com comfortable operating zone? 80? Uh, it would be more towards that end, yes. Okay. <clears throat> What authorities do you have in combating transnational criminal organizations, and what authorities would you like to have on top of that that you do not? So I say that I have a joint interagency task force South, which is a GIAT of South based out of Key West, that does a, uh, has the detection and monitoring mission. And then we uh, turn that information, that intelligence, over to law enforcement uh, or to our partner nations. Uh, depending on which is closest and who is able to go after it and, and uh, be able to disrupt it or interdict it. And so, uh, and in terms of the authorities, I have uh, the authorities that I need right now in order to do uh, what I need to do uh, based on the missions that I'm given in Southcom. Looking forward just at the, the narrative of globally right now, is there anything that's on your radar that we, we may need to be briefed on? So in the, uh, in the classified session, I can expand more upon all the activities that we're doing in the region. Certainly, I'm very thankful for all of the, the exercise uh, funding and resourcing that I do get. I could do more. I'd like to get more into the southern cone and have more presence, more persistence presence, not just episodic where we visit and you know, do uh, 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 maybe an exchange on cyber for a week or two weeks or an exchange with our special forces. I'd like to change up a PSYDUC to, uh, to more persistent. That, my next question may be for the classified setting as a former SOCOM guy. Um, is the SOCOM footprint in SOUTHCOM what you would like to see, or is that something that we could increase? And is their capabilities beneficial or continue Absolutely to be beneficial? Absolutely beneficial. Uh, uh, the TSOC that I have, the Special Operations, the Theater Special Operations Command, SOC South, as they're called, uh, at a Homestead Air Reserve Base in Florida. Um, fantastic, huge enabler to what we do. And the presence and the activities and the training and enabling that they do with our partner nations is absolutely essential. And it really uh, contributes to making our partners stronger. Um, as, a, as a border state, it, 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 does the Southcom footprint, is that, how, how is that handling the drug trafficking? And is there anything that we can do? Is there any, Again, any authorities that you might need in that in that space? So I would say in the we're not going to be able to interdict our way out of the drug trafficking. That's really, um, <clears throat> I think, going after the labs and going after the money laundering and getting after that follow the money piece of it is really the hard part. But that's really where we need to focus, because by the time that we're interdicting it, whether it's in the maritime domain. Uh, and uh, it's already been broken down one or two times already. It would be better to get it at the lab where it's being made and cultivated and things like that. Uh, but uh, the interdiction is, is not going to solve the problem. Uh, I have 30 seconds left. Is there anything that we haven't asked today that you, might, that you could speak about that would help, help, you, help, help us help you? Well, thank you, Congressman. It's really just the attention and the focus on this region and show that this region matters. This region is full of resources, and I worry about the malign activity of our adversaries taking advantage of that, looking like they're investing when they're really extracting. We have the lithium triangle in this region. 60% of the world's lithium, Argentina, Bolivia, Chile, have this. And it's taking resources away from these countries and from their people that are trying to deliver, these democracies that are trying to deliver for their people. And they're having a hard time doing it because of the malign activity of transnational criminal organizations. Uh, that, Gentlemen's uh, time's expired. Chair, and I recognize you from Pennsylvania, Mr. Deluzio. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And good morning, Assistant Secretary Dalton, General Van Herc, General Richardson, hello. Uh, I want to focus my questions, as many of my colleagues on, have today, on how Northcom and Southcom uh, are playing in a strategic competition, deterrence with China. Uh, frankly, I think, and I think most of my colleagues agree, whether it's trade, hollowing out of our industrial and manufacturing base, theft of IP, so much of this conduct has been commonplace uh, in the last however many decades with People's Republic of China. There's a New York Times article released yesterday, the daring ruse that exposed China's campaign to steal American secrets, highlighting efforts uh, among Ch communist Chinese officials to undermine our country, preying on scientists, academics, engineers, uh, and others. 
Of course, we have our own struggles, as General Richardson, you were just mentioning, you know, around critical materials and other pieces of our own things here at home. Uh, I want to turn, you know, to the, the Western Hemisphere, though, and efforts from China closer to home. Uh, General Richardson, I'll, I'll start with you. you know, Latin America has seen significant investment in diplomatic outreach from China. You've talked about it today. Uh, in your, your written testimony, you highlighted communist China's investment in critical infrastructure in the hemisphere. So tell me, if, if you could, what are your concerns here, and what do you propose that we in this committee or the government generally should and can do about it? I think we need to um, definitely concern with the, with the aggressiveness of that. The Belt and Road Initiative with 21 of 31 countries. Uh, uh, and we have four additional countries that aren't signatories of the BRI, but actually have PRC uh, projects that are going on in their countries. And so uh, quite a bit. So they're taking advantage of that. But then there's also the debt trap associated with it, the multiple loans. They don't invest, as I said, they don't invest in the country, they extract, they bring their own host nation workers. They've got an unemployment problem, so they bring their host nation, their own workers, Chinese laborers, to the country and uh, build these <coughs> high-rise apartments. Um, and so, you know, the investing, you don't see the investment in the country, and then sometimes those projects aren't done well. Yeah. And so what we try to do is capitalize upon that, again, meet the partner's needs where they are. Uh, we will bring the Corps of Engineers in, who's very prevalent in my, uh, in my uh, region, and uh, fix the project. But the, the capability of those funds um, is a sliver compared to what the PRC has. Um, but I would say in terms of our instruments of national power from our United States, we need to showcase that more. We have a lot of investment from our big companies that are in the Americas investing. We just don't advertise it. We're too modest, and we don't need to be modest anymore. We need to put our American flag, Team USA, on there, and we need to, we need to speak about what we're doing and make sure that the countries know how much actually the United States is involved. I would say trade is also very important. South America's number one trading partner now is the PRC. Uh, the region <clears throat> is still the United States, is still the number one trading partner, but we're, we're losing. We're starting to lose, and we remain flatlined with our trade. General, thank you. I, I want to also talk a bit about domestic critical infrastructure. Uh, Ms. Dalton, Assistant Secretary Dalton, excuse me, you mentioned in, uh, gray zone activities in your written testimony, uh, describing them as largely non-attributable, coercive means that fall below perceived thresholds for military action. Give us some sense, folks watching at home or who might look, hear about this later, what are we talking about? What do those activities look like? Absolutely. Uh, thanks so much, Congressman, for highlighting this. Um, the NDS makes quite clear that central to the PRC's theory of victory is coming after our critical infrastructure at home to subvert our ability to conduct force flow mobilization and project power in the event of crisis or contingency. So what they are doing today is getting into our, our systems, whether that's through cyber means, um, through um, counterintelligence um, and, and really across the, the gray zone spectrum um, to get a better understanding, a lay of the land of where potential vulnerabilities are from a critical infrastructure perspective. What makes this so complex, and General Van Herk alluded to this earlier, is um, the interdependencies uh, that defense critical infrastructure has with other sectors. Um, you know, whether that's water, telecommunications, or, or power, we're, we're going to have to work across our federal family. We're going to have to work uh, with state and local and tribal territorial governments, and we're going to have to work with the private sector um, to understand where those risks lie and how we close them. Well, I, my time is just about ended, but I'm glad you mentioned the private sector piece of this, too, given how much of our critical infrastructure is not publicly owned or controlled. So thank you. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Chair, and I recognize the gentleman from Alabama, Mr. Strong, for five minutes. Thank you, Secretary Dalton, General Van Herc, uh, General Richardson, thank you for coming before us. Last year, uh, General Van uh, Herc, last year during your Senate posture here, you testified that you were concerned about the ability to pace North uh, Korean missile production capacity and capabilities. Just yesterday, we saw uh, Kim Jong Un's sister warn that any attempt by the United States to intercept a missile test would be considered a declaration of war. As I've shared before, Redstone Arsenal is the center of gravity for missile defense agencies testing, integration, and field activity. 
Uh, they are all also a key player in fielding the next generation interceptor. General, can you share why it's important that the next generation interceptor reaches initial operating capacity as soon as possible? Absolutely, uh, Congressman. So the next generation interceptor will give us 20 additional uh, ground-based interceptors, it gives me additional uh, cap or capacity uh, to pace with the DPRK that you're talking about. But more importantly, it gives you capability. Uh, it gives you capability to uh, distinguish between uh, their ca uh, capabilities to deceive our uh, systems, if you will. We should talk more about that in a classified environment. Thank you. Uh, that, that's crucial. Also crucial is the service, service life extension program for the GBIs that's ongoing that creates additional reliability for me and gives me the, the ability to adjust my shot doctrine, which gives me additional capability or capacity as well. Thank you. How can the program be accelerated to meet IOC faster? Yeah, that's a great question for MDA. Uh, I think they have a great structure in place, the two companies that are competing, and the structure for the contract rewards going faster. Uh, we just need to make sure that we don't have bureaucratic mechanisms in place that slow down uh, the, the testing, the uh, fielding, those kind of capabilities. Thank you. General Van uh, Herc, I've noticed that you've been requesting uh, greater sensor coverage over the homeland for a while now. Uh, please know I support you in this effort. Uh, it is clear that in addition to being able to see various threats, uh, we need to, the ability uh, to defend against them also. Would you assess that the U.S. should provide better homeland defense against most uh, pressing missile threats, crews, and ballistic? I would assess that uh, based on the taskings I'm given that we do need additional capability for cruise missiles uh, and also uh, the ballistic missiles that you referenced there. Thank you. The Missile Defense Agency doesn't have the cruise missile responsibility the Air Force does. Uh, isn't that right, General? That is right, the way it's structured right now. Thank you. As part of the reason for that uh, is the threats to the U.S. homeland are many and uh, they are growing, yet we have kept the Missile Defense Agency's budget essentially capped at about uh, $8 billion uh, for years. This is concerning to me. I hope my colleagues will join me in uh, enacting the proper budget and policy investments this year to properly address what capabilities our armed forces need to protect America's people abroad, but also at home. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Chair, and I'll recognize the gentlelady from Texas, Ms. Escobar, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, many thanks to you and the ranking member for this very important hearing. Uh, thanks to our witnesses and General Richardson, thanks so much uh, for ongoing conversations. Um, you know, I've, I've long been a believer. Uh, I represent El Paso, Texas, a community uh, that is home to Fort Bliss, a key military installation. But also, we are the community that's uh, at our nation's front door. And so we frequently see, and we have seen for decades, that what happens through our, throughout the Western Hemisphere ultimately ends up at our doorstep. And I'm a big believer that we can't continue to just obsess about the border. We've got to obsess about the hemisphere. And so the, the work that is being done, especially around uh, targeting uh, criminal organizations that uh, prey upon communities south of us and prey upon vulnerable migrants who are fleeing their homeland, it's really critical that we do everything everything possible uh, to attack the, the challenge south of us, um, and that we provide the resources necessary, especially. Uh, at the same time, we have to realize what we do, living on the southern border and seeing the long lines for southbound checks for all of the weapons from the United States that are going south, we have to acknowledge as a country the role that we are playing in creating instability um, and access to weaponry that creates more violence and instability south of us. So I wanna thank you all so much for consistently shedding a light on all of that, but also for using um, what I consider not enough resources um, and trying to make them stretch and go a long way. It really is on Congress and on all of us. If we want to address much of what 
it, we are seeing as a country at our southern border, we have to provide the resources to all agencies and groups that are doing the, the incredibly hard work um, in our hemisphere. Um, with that, I would like um, for Secretary Dalton and actually all of our witnesses um, to respond if you can. Um, a critical aspect of addressing and combating the threats across the Northern and Southern Command AORs is acknowledging the infrastructure and networks that TCOs are using to traffic persons, weapons, and narcotics that make their way in and out of our country. Can you all speak to the efforts in support of the interagency uh, and our partners and allies to assess the size and complexity of these networks, and how are you working to dismantle them. Congresswoman, thank you so much uh, for, for the question, and I completely agree with your framing in terms of the need to look holistically and leveraging all the tools of, of national, state, and local uh, power to, to get after this challenge and with partners in, in the region. And um, I actually had an opportunity to visit uh, El Paso just a couple of weeks ago uh, to meet with uh, some of our local DHS and, and DOD officials um, doing some great work on, on, on this challenge set. Um, to answer your, your question, Congresswoman, woman. Um, DOD provides uh, detection and monitoring support and intelligence support um, through our counter-narcotics authorities um, to key partners in the region. And this fits into the administration's broader approach of addressing the root causes um, of migration and challenges in, in the region um, that have a bit of a Venn diagram overlap um, with the challenge of, of TCOs. Um, you know, they're, they're not one in the same challenges, um, but certainly the, the TCOs are creating conditions that, that fuel migration um, and the broader context of governance and development challenges are, are stressing to um, economies in, in the region and compelling um, not only the, the flow of irregular migration, but creating opportunities for the TCOs to thrive. Um, so that's the DOD piece um, in this broader framework, but I know General Richardson will have um, more great amplification on this. Thanks, Congresswoman. And uh, JTF North, which is in your uh, district as well, uh, has a big role here. First, I couldn't agree more. It's not about the border. It's about the Western Hemisphere, and we need to think much broader. Uh, TCOs are a global problem as well. Uh, General Sandoval and Admiral Ojeda uh, from Mexico often tell me that we also should focus on what comes south, not what comes north. And so JTF North has been instrumental in developing support to the interagency partners that we work with providing intel to go after money that's going south, the weapons that are going south, which are just as crucial. We're not going to interdict our way out of this problem. We need a broader holistic strategy that gets after that. And so uh, I look forward to continuing doing that. So as you said, Congresswoman, the, the TCOs bring violence and corruption, and then uh, and the PRC comes in and is able to exploit that. So it all connects together. But the violence is uh, its off the charts. Uh, these organizations are getting more powerful, $310 billion uh, revenue annually. They've diversified the portfolio. It's not just counter narcotics. It's human trafficking. It's illegal mining. It's illegal logging, fishing, whatever they can get their hands on. And then the Chinese money laundering that uh, with the seven PRC banks, 275 branches in the region. It's just a vicious cycle that continues. So the work that we do with the security cooperation to help our partner nation militaries and uh, public security forces deal with these challenges internally and be able to secure their borders and work cross-border with their neighbors uh, enables them to handle these situations so it uh, doesn't, again, just... Uh, General Lee's time's expired. Chair, and I recognize the gentleman from Florida, Mr. Jimenez, for five minutes. Thank you very much, and I um, want to expand on, on what you just said, uh, General Richardson, about uh, the banks, uh, the Chinese banks and the, and the branches that they have in South America. Do any of these uh, Chinese banks, uh, do they do business in the United States? Congressman, I'm not, uh, I'm not for sure. Uh, okay. I can't answer I think, that. I think we need to I... find out if they do, okay, so that we can take some yes, steps uh, against them, okay, and, right. and these activities, because they, they, they seem to be what the mo money laundering arm of these enterprises is. Uh, are these Chinese banks? Is that what you're saying? They're a piece of it. Okay. All right. Fair enough. Um, 
And, and thank you again for, for the uh, briefing that you gave me in, uh, in Southcom. Um, for those of you who know, Southcom is about a mile away from my, from my district, and it's a very important part of my, my district. And um, it, uh, some of the things you told me you know, were you, you've said here, but you said that 60% of the lithium uh, in the world, the world supply of lithium comes from South America. What percentage of that 60% is actually controlled by the PRC? Uh, I don't have the answer to that, but I could uh, I could try to get that for you from uh, one of our interagency partners. Would but you say it's a significant amount? It's uh, the the uh, when you talk to the uh, U.S. ambassadors for Chile and uh, Argentina, and then the the companies that are there, uh, the uh, aggressiveness of the PRC and the ground game that they have with the lithium is um, uh, is is very advanced and very aggressive. Yeah, look, uh, I, I don't think the combating China, I mean, combating the PRC in South America, because I do believe that that's our greatest threat. It's just going to take military. It's going to be the military, although you, you all do a great job in, in the partnerships. It's actually an economic. And I believe that for far too long we have ignored our own backyard uh, and allowed Russia, uh, China, Iran, uh, adversaries of the United States to actually make great footholds in, into our uh, region, and we need to do something about it. Uh, and it has to be a holistic approach, economic approach. How do we help our neighbors? Because the PRC is not helping our neighbors. They're building the infrastructure with their own people, their own material, uh, and, then, and then getting those countries to actually pay for their own people. So it's actually a pretty good gig, okay? Uh, it's, it's a great racket, what they're doing right now. Um, uh, General Van Herc, uh, we talked about uh, your cooperation with Mexican authorities um, uh, dealing with the cartels. Do you think they're doing enough? Do I think the Mexicans are doing enough? Yeah. Uh, I think uh, everybody can do more than we are right now th uh, to look at this problem. They are doing a significant amount. They have tens of thousands of forces applied to the problem. The problem just continues to grow, though. So I think that's a, a better policy question than it is for a military. I stand ready to support if directed to do more, uh, directed to plan more, et cetera. Well, it wasn't a policy question. It was a question. Are they doing it enough? Are they do, if you, do you think that if we had, if, uh, if we in the United States were allowing uh, our organizations to flood Mexico and kill 100,000 Mexicans a year, do you think that they'd be happy about it? I don't think they would uh, be happy about that, Congressman. Would they be asking us to do more? Uh, I would ask them. I, I would assume they would. Okay. Do you think they should do more? I think we all can do more. Okay, fair enough. One other question, I have about a minute 30. Uh, I live in Miami, and I have a bunch of friends in Miami, and there are a bunch of them are coming and saying, hey, you need to see what's going on in the Bahamas with, uh, with the PRC. So what's going on in the Bahamas? And by the way, the Bahamas are 50 miles away. Yeah, Congressman, I couldn't agree with you more. Uh, the PRC is aggressively pursuing their economic coercion in, in the uh, Bahamas. They've built the biggest... Uh, embassy around the globe in the Bahamas. They have a very aggressive ambassador, uses the information space to undermine us each and every day. Uh, the resort that they built on top of our uh, cables that come ashore there, which are crucial for command and control, which are crucial for economic uh, prosperity, those kinds of things uh, as well. They're right over that as they gain additional access to land and right on top of the Navy's uh, test and training facilities in the Atlantic uh, as well. So they're very aggressive in the Bahamas. They, they after the hurricane uh, in Abaco Island, uh, the uh, Chinese financed and uh, ensured they built a port there. That port's not being used for military purposes right now, but it's another indicator of their aggressive nature uh, to coerce and use their economic uh, influence around the globe. And we don't have an ambassador since 2011 to the Bahamas? Uh, there's a, currently an ambassador that's nominated, uh, but not uh, uh, co uh, confirmed. And it's been since 2011 since we've had an ambassador. Fair enough. That's very concerning to me because, obviously, you know I live in Miami, and that's only 50 miles away. So thank you very much, for your, and my, my time's up. I yield my time back. Chair, and I recognize Jen Lake from Pennsylvania, Ms. Houlihan, for five minutes. Oops, thank you, and thank you to the panel for coming and speaking to us. General Richardson, um, my questions are uh, 
for you for at first. The TCOs are very much a large part of the reasons why we have concerns about the security of the southern border, and you spoke about that here and also in your testimony uh, about the flow of drugs that they are generating. These guys are super well funded, $310 billion annually, as you also noted in your testimony. Can you talk a little bit about, if you're able in this setting, these criminal organizations and how they're receiving support from the PRC co connected criminal organizations and what Southcom is doing to prevent that? So the, uh, the uh, connection, um, the, the, what the TCOs do with the violence and the corruption, and it, it uh, cracks the uh, fragile, the fragility. You know, these democracies, again, are trying to deliver for their people. It creates unsecurity and uh, unstable environments. It causes people to have to move and get on the move. It, it feeds into this irregular migration when people and families don't feel safe. But what are the mechanisms that the PRC is exercising to deliver funding or support to, the, to these organizations, to these criminal organizations? So through the, uh, through the money laundering, in terms of the, uh, uh, the transnational criminal organizations being able to provide the money Money to the PRC, who then uh, sell it back to the countries through um, through the goods, uh, is uh, one way to do it. Uh, we have uh, law enforcement agencies within that work as part of liaison officers within Southcom. We try to connect those dots, work very closely with Department of Treasury, Justice, Commerce, yep. uh, on following this money because I think, as I said earlier. Uh, getting after how you follow the money and what is actually, uh, you know, uh, enabling this piece to clean the money and be able for these organizations to flourish is uh, we've got to get after that in and, order to counter it. And then real quickly, you mentioned you felt like you had the authorities that you needed in those particular areas. You also mentioned twice today that we are too modest, that we should put our flag on more things that U.S. companies are doing things that we here, you know, with uh, federal um, money and taxpayer money are doing things. What do you mean by putting your flag on it more when you're speaking about industry or private industry? How can we advertise more explicitly? What are you, What's your idea? And I, I'm, I'm gaining this perspective when I meet with leaders uh, in the countries and um, and they uh, don't, uh, they're not, don't seem to be aware of a lot of the United States investment. Uh, the tenders that come out, the project bids uh, for big projects within these countries only have Chinese bidders. So it's all this information I'm receiving from them that we're not. And then when I meet with uh, the our companies, I've met with the Atlantic Council, the Council of the Americas, and these companies have an opportunity to tell me what they're doing. And there's a mismatch in what uh, the country sees and what our companies say they're doing. And so that's why I said we, uh, uh, it seems to me that we need to bring all of our uh, strengths together and advertise it, say what we're doing, uh, okay. to talk about Team USA and the investment in this region and how important it is, because it absolutely is. Thank you. And, and General Van Herc, with my remaining time, I wanted to drill down on something that you talked about. I just recently led a delegation to Finland and to Norway, bipartisan delegation, and we spoke a lot about the Arctic. And I know this hearing is not necessarily about that, but you, but you brought it into, into play. Can you talk a little bit about your insights into the impact that uh, climate change is having in the Arctic, what it means for national security vis-a-vis -vis, uh, Russia and even China as well? Uh, you also mentioned that you were worried about being ready to train and, and wanted more resources in that area. We're hoping that the budget would reflect that. If you could be more specific about what you're looking for when the president's budget is released, that would be great. Thanks. Uh, environmental change is absolutely having a significant impact in the Arctic. It gives access to resources, which is going to definitely uh, challenge uh, nations. There will be friction. So competition is important. That's what the, uh, the national defense strategy tells us to do is go after competing in the Arctic. As far as uh, uh, the importance and, and the capabilities we need. So persistence is one thing. So the jobs and infrastructure bill uh, provided $250 million for the Port of Nome, which will help me with persistence in the Arctic. Communications capabilities as well. When you get north of about 65 latitude, it's very challenging environment. So the commercial, uh, such as SpaceX through Starlink, has given uh, the opportunity for us to take advantage of that. I need more funding for terminals to use that allow us to access the, those kinds of capabilities. Infrastructure is crucial for campaigning. It's also crucial for crisis and uh, when we defend our homeland. Infrastructure is severely limited, both in Canada and the U.S., and access to infrastructure such as in Thule, uh, Greenland as well. 
So when you only have a day's worth of fuel or, or a limited uh, billeting, those things will prevent me from doing what I need to do to defend the homeland. Thank you. I've, I've run out of time. I yield back. Chair now recognizes the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Fallon, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for having this hearing. It's very, it's vitally important. Uh, uh, General Van Herc, in January, um, there were 1,400 pounds of fentanyl seized at the southern border. I mean, I found that to be startling. And uh, so I'd like to start, if we can, dial it back a minute. And Ms. Dalton, do you believe that na national security, the border security is a national security issue? It's a homeland security issue. Do you think it's a national security issue? We, we have national security interests yes or no. in it's a, a secure border. It's a really border. simple question. Yes or no? We, we have national security interests in a secure so border. Yes? You're not going to answer? Yes or no? It, we have national security okay. interests right. in a secure Thank you. border. Um, so, General Van Herc, same question. It's real simple. Is border security a national security issue? I'm on record of saying that border security is national security. See, it's not that hard. Yes. Thank you. You know, it's interesting because we, I, I had an amendment to the NDAA in 2021, and it simply said that. And I was very careful in crafting it. It was one page because I wanted it to be a unanimous vote. And it did pass. We were in the Republicans were in the minority at the time. It was 3128, and it passed 3326, which meant that five Democrats voted for that and agreed with the statement that the general just made and I made. But 26 Democrats said no. They voted no, which was shocking to me. So as you know, we laid out that securing our southern border against transnational criminal organizations and drug dealers and human traffickers, weapon smugglers, terrorists, and various other criminals is a matter of national security. And what we really ultimately have to decide is, is the United States federal government going to control our southern border, or are we going to let the Mexican drug cartels do it? Because we've seen in the last couple of years, we had never had a month that we had over 200,000 illegal border crossings. And then we had... 10 months in a row of over 200,000 illegal border crossings. We had caught over 100 people that were on the terrorist watch list. We had 160 countries represented by folks that were crossing the border illegally. 25,000 pounds of fentanyl has been seized, and even more now over the last couple of years, which is enough to kill every man, woman, and child dozens of times over. And we lost 108,000 Americans to fentanyl overdoses last year. And as we mentioned, uh, General, about the 1,400 pounds. So earlier this year, I co-sponsored legislation to author legislation to author military force against any foreign nation, organization, or person responsible for trafficking fentanyl in the United States. Specifically, it names nine cartels that have used violence and intimidation to wreak havoc in our country and in Mexico and Central America. So, General, do you believe that the Mexican drug cartels present a clear and present danger to the United States? I believe that uh, transnational cr criminal organizations are a global security problem, which would include here in the homeland. And, and sir, what are your thoughts on authorizing military force against the cartels to stop the deadly flow of narcotics into our country? I think that's a policy decision. If directed to plan and execute uh, and use military force, then I would do that. Posse comitatus prevents me from enforcing our laws. I believe that uh, inside the United States, this problem is a homeland security Department of Justice problem, not a DOD problem, and they need to be fully resourced to execute their missions. And what else do you think, in your opinion, we could use to effectively confront the cartels and to protect the, the country? I, th I think uh, information sharing, uh, helping uh, our interagency partners, which is what we're doing, is uh, crucial. I think information sharing with Mexico and other uh, Western Hemisphere nations, as General Richardson has discussed, is crucial to enable them uh, to, to address the problems that they have on their soil. Their problems on their soil are a problem on our soil as well, and so we need to work together. And so I really quickly, too, want to get to the fact that you stated uh, in your testimony uh, in front of the United States Senate, I found this fascinating, that most GRU members, we would probably know them colloquially as KGB, the, 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 um, their predecessors, that most of the GRU members in the world are in Mexico at the moment, which I found startling that those Russian intelligence personnel, you know, and they're keeping a close eye on their opportunities for influence in the United States. And then in FY 2022, Customs and Border Patrol officers encountered 21,763 illegal aliens from Russia. And then in this fiscal year, it's been 17,000 already. And, you know, you think about that, and even if 1% of those are Russian intelligence agents, 
uh, th and that's the ones we caught, never mind the ones we didn't. I mean, we could be looking at a battalion of K essentially KGB officers in our country. So is it a reasonable assumption that adversarial intelligence services such as the Russians uh, and hostile non-state actors would take advantage of the vulnerabilities at the southern border to serve their interests? Congressman, I would say that uh, potential adversaries uh, would take advantage of any opportunity uh, to gain access here, wh whether it's the southern border, whether it be through cyberspace, the information space as well. They're going to take advantage of any loops or gaps. Gentlemen's time's here. expired. Chair, and I recognize the gentleman from California, Mr. Carbajal, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to all the witnesses for being here today. General Richardson, you highlighted significant investments from the People's Republic of China into the South, Southcom AOR. I agree with you that strengthening partnerships to help partner democracies deliver for their population is imperative in helping counter the PRC's influence. Do you think we can strengthen relationships with countries who are sympathetic to the PRC through this strategy? And what other strategies are being implemented to encourage alternatives to cooperation with the PRC? And how can Congress help to further uh, that support. So thank you, Congressman. I think that the work that we do with, uh, the answer is yes. And uh, the, uh, the work that we do with security cooperation, building those relationships. Uh, I'd like to highlight the, uh, the, the uh, uh, IMET, the uh, International Military Education and Training, as well as the uh, Professional Military Education. When you're talking about building that trust, uh, not just at the leader level, but all the way down at uh, leaders, because they grow up to be in charge of their militaries and uh, their services. And the investment that we make in that program, I would say that we really need to look hard at it and continue to fund that and maybe even a little bit more because it's so important. When I can pick up the phone and, and we can have a conversation, the folks that have been, the military leaders that have been to school in the United States speak English. There's no translating. We've already built the trust. We are uh, already crossed the bridge and we're building the relationship already as opposed to not. And so just a, a, a shout out for that education uh, training program because it's just huge. It's a huge enabler for us. Uh, but the security cooperation, the train and equip, understanding the challenges from their perspective, being able to link the leaders together from the different nations, uh, we've been very successful at that. Uh, and they can do cross-border operations because the borders a lot of times between our partner nations are very porous uh, and they're not wanting to cause an international uh, incident. So uh, there might be some seams and gaps there, uh, closing those gaps and having those leaders work together. And I have many cases where they've been able to do that uh, over the past years. But uh, those levers that, that I have in order to make our partner nations stronger are really where we... Um, where we succeed as partners, and our partner nations succeed, and we succeed as a team, team democracy. Thank you, General. General Van Herk, as you noted, the administration funded over-the-horizon radars, allowing us to better detect potential threats to the homeland. Can you elaborate on how this enhanced detection capability will create more time for military leaders, allowing for the creation of better deterrence options and on how the over-the-horizon radar will affect NORAD's capabilities. Yes, thank you. So today's radar systems designed basically and implemented in the 80s only allow me to see, uh, based on the curvature of the Earth, a, a distance that I would say is a couple hundred miles, okay? Uh, over-the-horizon capabilities will bounce off the ionosphere and give me uh, the ability to see potentially a couple thousand miles or beyond. And no, not only that for airborne objects, but maritime uh, objects as well as space uh, objects, and depending on how you prioritize though. So it gives me the ability to see further in the future, to anticipate what may come our way, and create options for me as an operational commander by positioning forces, or at the strategic level with the president or the secretary, the option to pick up the phone and have a discussion with the nation and create uh, deterrent type of options ahead of time. As far as NORAD, it's crucial to field these uh, to give us the ability to not only see, like we said, uh, airborne objects, but to be able to provide my threat warning for NORAD, which is crucial to strategic stability, to be able to see hypersonics, to be able to see uh, objects that could potentially emanate from space as well. Thank you, General. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Chair, now recognize the gentlelady from Michigan, Ms. McLean, for five minutes. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman, um, and thank you all for being here today. General Richardson, you've warned about uh, China's constant attempts to invest further in the Southcom AOR. Um, General, would you agree that several of the countries in your AOR adopt socialist or communist regimes? Um, it is even more important than ever for the United States to be involved in South America. Absolutely, Congresswoman. We need to be more involved, pay more attention to what is so close to our homeland. This is our neighborhood. This is a shared neighborhood. And neighbors watch out for each other. We're good to each other. We help each other. Um, and, uh, and so absolutely. But I would say that they're paying attention to the PRC, not because they want to, it's because they have to. And in the past, you've raised the specific issue of the Port of Cartagena in Colombia. The Chinese have been attempting to gain um, a majority stake at this vital port um, in South America. If they are successful, they would have access to a deep water port, but more importantly, China would have uh, a significant ISR asset. I want to know specifically what tools do you have to counter Chinese investments in Southcom? So uh, in order to counter the investment that they have is to uh, talk about it, which is what I'm doing. I'm bringing awareness to the fact that uh, when there are tenders and projects uh, that come out from the countries and there are only Chinese bidders on there, we have got to get our international community, our uh, uh, Western investment, our Team USA investment focused on what these countries, when these bids come out. Uh, so that they have a choice. Uh, it's not just all Chinese uh, state-owned enterprises, and we got to pay attention to that. Would you agree that we could use a little more help in this in this task? Uh, I do. I think <laughs> it's the the awareness and talking about it and and making it uh, making it well known that we're we're not competing as we should, and we can and we can out compete. We can. And Congress established the developmental the Development Finance Corporation in 2018 Build Act. The DFC was supposed to facilitate private sector investments that specifically um, complemented and are guided by overall United States foreign policy development and national security objectives. Has DFC been working with Southcom to establish investments in Southcom AOR to achieve our national security objectives? So I would, um, want to, I would want to come back to you, Congresswoman, on that to make sure that I give you the correct answer. I think that, um, as I've said, we can uh, continually, we got to uh, shine the light on it and make that, uh, that investment and uh, coordinated, consolidated, and more aggressive. Point blank, do you, what tools, if you can articulate, do you specifically need that you don't have? I would say just the continued uh, resourcing of my requirements for security cooperation, my exercise program, uh, the State Department's uh, foreign military sales, financing, uh, excess defense articles. And we make those processes, which are really more long-term. We've got to pressurize sure. them and make them to, to where they deliver within months, not and I, years. And I want to go back to this D the DFC. Is you will get back with me on my question on have they been working with you and to what end? Because yes. we give them a lot of taxpayer dollars, and I want to make sure that those taxpayer dollars are being spent. Right. Um, it, we're getting good value for our money, right. so to speak. I mean, Congress established the DFC to help counter the Belt and Road Initiative, mm. right, from the CCP. DFC was supposed to be coordinating private sector investments in projects that benefit the United States, um, that, that benefit our interests. Instead, what I'm seeing is DFC has dozens of product, pro, uh, projects in the Western Hemisphere that provide not a, not, no real value to the national security, while at the same time China is investing in critical infrastructure, I mean mineral mining for their military and, and to provide greater IRS, ISR in, in the AOR. So what's a little concerning, and I don't mean this disrespectfully, but you can't rattle this off at the top of your head, yet I, I'm sure if we ask China, they have direct mining initiatives, Belt and Road. I mean, they have clear and precise initiatives. In my opinion, Congress needs to take a hard look at the DFC, the, the DFC's mandates, when, le when there's legislation to, to reauthorize this agency when it comes up for reauthorization this year. I mean, we need to take a good, hard look at what are those dollars getting spent for 
and are they being spent appropriately? Gentlelady's time's expired. Chair, and I recognize the gentleman from Nevada, Mr. Horse, for five minutes. Thank you very much, Chairman Rogers and Ranking Member Smith for holding this important hearing. Uh, Assistant Secretary Dalton, in your testimony, you mentioned that rising temperatures, uh, droughts, and more frequent, intense, and unpredictable storms and floods have already begun to affect military readiness and impose significant cost on the department. I agree with you uh, that these environmental hazards are degrading re readiness, critical infrastructure, and capabilities. Uh, in my home state of Nevada, the vast majority of the state is currently experiencing a severe uh, drought. That means that 2.6 million people are affected by the drought, with 6.13% of Nevadans experiencing extreme drought. Uh, the Colorado River Basin has racked up such dramatic deficits that a single season can't foretell the dire water supply concerns. And Lake Mead, the nation's largest reservoir, has fallen by about 170 feet since the current drought began in 2000 and currently sits at 27% capacity. In fact, if Lake Mead falls below 950 feet, it will go to dead pool status, which will prevent it from generating power that serves 40 million people throughout the West. This clearly has an impact on our readiness, including the bases in my district at Nellis Air Force Base, Creech Air Force Base, the National Test and Training Range, and the Hawthorne Army Depot. So could you explain how extreme weather is affecting our military readiness further and how the department is addressing climate resiliency? Congressman, thank you for highlighting this really important issue. The NDS captures it as a um, critical transboundary challenge um, facing not just the United States, um, but also our global network of, of allies and partners. The department is, is seeking to make our systems more resilient uh, to a range of threats that result from our, or are exacerbated by extreme weather events which are being reshaped by climate change, increasing the resilience of our bases, making our structures, power grids, fuel distribution systems, and water lines more survivable, not only gives us a strategic advantage, um, particularly in contested logistics, um, but also improves our operational effectiveness. The military's mission is to provide the most lethal, effective, and capable fighting force, and that requires adapting to a changing security environment, including the effects of climate change. Additionally, working to build the resiliency of our partners to respond to climate-related disaster response efforts through both DOD and non-DOD programming will help DOD sustain focus on our key warfighting mission. For example, um, Southcom is working with allies and partners in the Caribbean to enhance their planning capabilities and better prepare for the anticipated impacts of extreme weather events and regional climate-related hazards through an upcoming tabletop exercise. And we're grateful for Congress's support of a new authority, the Defense Operational um, Resilience International Cooperation uh, Fund um, that will enable us to help build the resiliency of, of our allies and partners abroad. But we're looking at this uh, both domestically and abroad uh, to tackle the, the effects of climate change. And what happens if we fail to build resilience against these effects of climate change and its effect on the loss of military uh, capability? Thank you, Congressman. Let me give you a, a pretty stark example. Um, the NDS makes clear the PERC is our pacing challenge. The priority theater, theater is the Indo-Pacific. When we look at Pacific islands um, that we rely upon for access basing and overflight for priority war plan plans for PRC contingency, those are the very islands that are um, subject to uh, storm surge and sea level rise um, over the next 10 to 20 years. Um, and so if we failed to build climate resiliency um, in the Pacific Islands, um, key locations like the Kuala J Jalin Atoll, um, that has critical missile defense uh, capabilities, um, we're going to be at, at risk of being able to, to perform our warfighting missions full stop. Well, I appreciate very much uh, the department taking these challenges seriously uh, for you answering my questions, and I look forward to continuing to work with the department and this committee to address the threats uh, facing our national security, including those uh, related to climate. Thank you. I yield back. Chair, now recognize you from Texas. Uh, Mr. Jackson, for five minutes. 
Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate it. And I also want to thank our witnesses for taking time out of your schedule to be here today. Much appreciated. Uh, the past five to 10 years have brought with them unprecedented challenges in North and South America, including natural disasters, political upheaval, a border and migration crises, and a pandemic. Uh, overshadowing all of these challenges are the ever-growing attempts of the Chinese Communist Party to achieve influence and a foothold right here in the Western Hemisphere. In the last five years, and I know this has been touched on a little bit, in the last five years, Taiwan has lost four allies in Central America. Panama in 2017, El Salvador in 2018, Dominican Republic in 2018, and Nicaragua in 2021. In all cases, the severing of these relationships with Taiwan came hand in hand with Chinese predatory economic tactics uh, in the form of investments and loans for these small countries, uh, something Beijing has been able to exploit all over the world, quite frankly. The majority of Chinese enticements uh, to these small, vulnerable countries have come in the form of significant financial aid and investment in exchange for severing ties with Taiwan. Uh, General Richardson, to your knowledge, have any Chinese offers involved military assistance, and have there been any requirements from the PRC to allow access to Chinese forces uh, on any territories here in the Western Hemisphere? So in terms of the uh, hardware and the uh, uh, ability, so the, the PRC does uh, compete uh, in terms of the, um, whether a, a country is looking for vehicles or aircraft or things like that. And so um, certainly with our processes and, and the, the countries now, partner nations are looking at uh, because of the economies and the, and, um, and the, the issues with their economies, they're looking at what's the best finance package too, mm -hmm. uh, to also um, be able to, uh, before they make the big decision on, on buying uh, uh, aircraft or, um, or vehicles and things like that. And so uh, the PRC is definitely competing in that space. In the, in the military space as well. And uh, in terms of the, they're more in the terms of training and education, all expense paid training and education to Beijing and to China uh, for one year, two year, and even uh, recently found out about a four year program. But to date, really no uh, big plans for installations, ports, things of that nature that we see going on right now in Africa and other I would places. say what the PRC is doing now, sir, is setting the theater, is mm -hmm. what I call it, yep. or setting the table uh, for uh, the state owned enterprises that come in and could be used for dual use capability for the military in the future. So while they, we don't have any bases right now from the PRC, I would say that that is something that will eventually happen possibly 7, 10, 15 years from now. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. That makes, that makes sense. Thank you. Um, as we've discussed today, uh, some of our most sensitive, vital, and advanced defense platforms rely heavily on certain ranges of the spectrum. Uh, China also relies on the spectrum for its defense apparatus. However, here in the United States, our spectrum usage and allocation system is currently somewhat flu in flux, uh, and there's a lot of debate on how we're going to ultimately resolve this. Uh, General Van Hurt, do you believe that China is exploiting our spectrum allocation in the, in the dilemma that we're currently going through regarding uh, this, uh, uh, this spectrum, and are they making significant advances uh, beyond our own capabilities? If so, do you believe that we can make up our losses on this issue? And uh, how do you suggest we recapture the high ground on spectrum? Congressman, I don't have any direct uh, evidence that uh, China is uh, uh, exploiting the uh, electromagnetic spectrum. I would say that that would be their intent if they could, the, the way they exploit everything else. Uh, I believe that what we need to do with regards to spectrum is not look at it from only a commercial aspect, a sale, but a national security aspect and ensure that all decisions with regards to spectrum look and assess the impact in national security, the ability to accomplish all of our national security missions. Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, one last question. Uh, in Europe, we operate in a theater with many allies uh, possessing uh, military capabilities and technologies. Uh, we rely on knowing that when deterring aggression or stopping bad actors there, we have capable, competent, trained forces with whom we can work side by side with. Uh, Southcom, by contrast, uh, operates in an area of the world where we're just kind of discussing to some extent that is often still developing and lacks institutional knowledge and defense means and resourcing that many of our European allies have. General Richardson, how does Southcom manage the distinct power and resource imbalance between the U.S. and our Southcom AOR allies when it comes to ensuring U.S. strategic interests in South America and the UCOM NATO model are, are different from what we, uh, we, we face in, in this command. So Congressman, I'm happy to report that we uh, just last spring, um, myself and the other allies that operate within the region signed a Western Hemisphere framework. 
And that's really a non-binding agreement, but it's a, it's a commitment to work better together, to share information. And uh, as we are getting after integrated deterrence and team democracy in the Western Hemisphere, that's really what that's about. Chair, now um, I'm recognizing the gentleman from Nebraska thank you, ma for five minutes. Thank you to all three of you for being here today. It's uh, great to see General Van Herc, who I've had the honor of working with in the past. And thank you, General Richardson, Richardson for visiting yesterday. I want to clarify with uh, General Van Herc some of the news reporting on the Chinese reconnaissance balloon. Some of the news reports claim that the citizens of Montana detected the balloon, which then led the military to brief the president on, what, uh, on the location of it and what was going on. And, and the reporting indicates that was the first the president had heard of it. Is that the case? We're, did we wait until citizens detected the balloon before we briefed the, the president on the balloon status? Congressman, I can't answer that question because I didn't specifically uh, discuss that with the White House. I can tell you that on 27 January, I made the, uh, the department aware, and when we detected it with radar on the 28th of January, again, I made them aware and made my assessment that there was no hostile intent, that being maneuvering to seek an offensive advantage or hostile acts such as dropping weapons, uh, and I provided that to the department. I just a little worrisome that it sounds like in some of the reporting that the president wasn't going to be briefed, but the fact that citizens saw it triggered you know, the briefs to the president. So, so those, that would be my concern. I'd like to follow up too on your comment on the, uh, the mid-band frequency spectrum. Uh, you mentioned earlier that the auction of the, of the part of the spectrum that our radars operate in that area would have a significant impact on your mission. If the science indicates that it's possible to effectively share the spectrum in these frequency ranges, ranges would that reduce the risk to your mission, or, or should we be even more cautious and not go down that path at all? Yeah, Congressman, ultimately it's a policy decision. Uh, with regards to sharing, I, I'm agnostic to the solution. We just need to understand the impacts of any sell-off uh, on national security and defend in our homeland. Thank you. And General Richardson, uh, Brazil's a rising power. How do you characterize our two countries' relationships? How's it trending, and what can we do to involve Brazil more in the world's leadership of standing up to authoritarian regimes and being part of the free nations. Continue to engage, Congressman. Um, we have a foreign liaison officer at United States Southern Command, the second one from Brazil. Uh, we need to keep that relationship and build upon that. And it's through our exercise program, I really think that uh, we're able to continue to build that. We have a very good mill to mill. I have the Chief of Defense that's visiting the Southcom headquarters this, this coming Monday and Tuesday of next week. And, um, and then I will go to Brazil next month and visit with the Minister of Defense as well as the Chief of Defense again. But it's to build that trust. We have a brand new administration that's in the seat. And so clean slate and we gotta move out. Thank you. Uh, would you benefit from having more Navy and Air Force presence in the southern part of South America? I would say our presence from, uh, from Team USA in the region, as I said earlier, getting down into the southern cone because it is, it is a little bit further and it takes, uh, you know, we need to visit our partners there. We need to be with them on the field. We need to meet with them in person. We need to do exercises in that region and be present because there's a lot of, uh, I think that that's why the PRC has been able to uh, gain inroads uh, in the southern cone of Latin America because we're not there. We're not there to compete with them on the field. Thank you. General Van Herka, one last question since I've got a little more time. One of the things that concerns me is uh, nuclear command and control and having the survivability of it. I know it's more in the STRACOM, uh, STRACOM realm. What's your take on, what's, our, what's your assessment of our ability to track hypersonic weapons and the warning times that, that, that we would have to respond. I'll give you more in a classified setting, but I have significant concerns about my ability to track hypersonics and cruise missiles for that matter, and track undersea capabilities for submarines that could potentially threaten us, and uh, cyber threats to our homeland. I've, I'm on record, I've been saying it for three years, so I'm significantly concerned about that. You know, with that in mind, I think we need to do more on strengthening our command and control survivability. Yeah, well, I want to point out on. why this is crucial. Okay, this is decision space for our national security apparatus, for continuity of government, for survival of our nuclear forces. And when you can't provide threat warning or attack assessment in a timely manner, then strategic stability erodes and the potential risk of strategic deterrence failure goes up. So I couldn't agree more. We need to be very concerned about that. 
The Russians and the Chinese must know that we can respond, and we have to ensure that we have the capabilities in place to do it. Thank we, you. we absolutely can respond. And I, I would remind you that uh, the foundation of homeland defense is the nuclear deterrent. Yep. It's a safe, secure, reliable uh, nuclear deterrent that we have today. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank the gentleman. Chair, and I recognize the gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Scott, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I'd like to take just a minute to read from each of our witnesses' testimony. And General Richardson, on page two, uh, you give a pretty bold and direct statement. Today, the PRC has both the capability and intent to issue international norms, advance its brand of author authoritarianism, and amass power and influence at the expense of the existing and emerging democracies in our hemisphere. This is a decisive decade, and our actions or inactions regarding the PRC will have ramifications for decades to come. I agree with you 100 percent, and I appreciate you being as bold as you are with that statement. General Van Herk, in your statement on page 4, in May of 2022, the PRC and Russia conducted a combined bomber patrol over the Sea of Japan coinciding with the Quad Leader Summit in Tokyo. The May 2022 Bomber Patrol was followed by a second Bomber Patrol in November of 2022. The cooperation is not confined to the air domain. PRC and Russian naval forces conducted a combined patrol in the fall of 2022. Ms. Dalton, in your testimony. In the NDS, the Secretary directed the department to act urgently to sustain and strengthen U.S. determinants with the People's Republic of China as the pacing challenge for the department in Russia. A stark example of these challenges, going, pushing along forward, was recently brought to the attention of the American people and the world when the PRC irresponsibly entered our sovereign airspace with a high altitude balloon. We know with certainty they intended to surveil sensitive U.S. military and critical infrastructure sites. I would have changed one word and put intentionally, maybe, instead of uh, irresponsibly. But I think your statement is very direct as well. And General Van Herk, I, I appreciate you giving specific examples of the alliance between China and Russia. Mr. Alfred, I believe it was earlier, uh, or Alfred, said, how do we get America to wake up? Less than 14 days after China flew that balloon across the United States of America, Ford Motor Company, one of America's most iconic brands, announced a multi-billion dollar partnership with Communist China's CATL for battery technology. Are you aware of this? Are, are y'all aware of this? I'm not aware of that, Congressman. Yeah, less than, okay. I hope you'll look at that. Less than 15 days. Now, I've thought about whether or not this was the right action or not, because I don't like the heavy hand of government, but every now and then it needs to be used. And I'll tell you something. Someone at that Pentagon needs to have enough brass to pick up the phone and call Ford Motor Company and tell them that the DOD will not purchase any vehicle that, that, that has that communist Chinese technology in it. Now, I don't have a choice as a consumer. When I go to a Home Depot and I want to buy a power tool, Every tool is made in China. The American citizens can either, can either walk out of that store without a power tool or they can buy one made in China. But I'm going to tell you something. The DOD budget's big enough that we can correct this action. We should have started correcting this a long time ago. Now, Vietnam. Vietnam, we lost 58,000 Americans in almost 20 years, if I'm not mistaken. Over 100,000 overdoses this last year in the United States of America. You have all testified that China is indifferent and not willing to help us with this. Is that correct? Congressman, I did say that. They're turning a blind eye to the precursors. Turning a blind eye to the deaths that we have. I apologize if the rest of you didn't say it, but it's pretty much the consensus of our intelligence community, our military community, is China could help, but they won't. Corporate America's got to step up to the plate and help us stop this. And I will tell you, it's time for the heavy hand of government to, to pick up the phone and call Ford Motor Company and say, you developed those batteries with China? 
and we're not buying any of your battery powered vehicles through the Department of Defense. With that, I yield the remainder of my time. We can do that statutorily. I think I, I'll help you with that. I'll help you with it. Uh, now Mr. We've Chairman, got, I plan to. <laughs> now we've got the gentleman from Indiana, Mr. Banks, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, General uh, Van Herc, how many times have you briefed, specifically briefed, the President of the United States about the situation at the border? Congressman, I have not personally briefed the President of the United States. Has the President of the United States requested a briefing from you about the situation at the border? Not that I'm aware of. Are you surprised by that? Uh, no, not, not necessarily. Um, he works closely with, obviously, the Secretary and senior leaders, uh, but I'm not necessarily surprised. It's been said many times already, 107,375 Americans have died from drug overdose, overdoses specifically related to fentanyl, leading cause of death of Americans my age in this country today. And we know that the vast majority of that fentanyl is coming across the southern border. It surprises me greatly. Frankly, it angers me that the President of the United States of America is so tone deaf and has turned a blind eye that he's not asking the top general in the United States of America task with overseeing a drug interdiction at our southern border to come and brief him on the leading cause of a death of Americans of working age in this country. What is the specific role that uh, you are playing at the border to stop drugs from coming into this country? So to be clear, I'm in support of Homeland Security. Uh, I don't have a direct role. I can't enforce the law because posse comitatus prevents me from doing that day to day. So my direct role is providing support, such as intel analysis, uh, detection and monitoring, those types of things, but I'm not authorized to provide the support that you're talking about. What is NORTHCOM doing at the southern border? We, we are doing two things. Number one, we provide support through the request for assistance from uh, Homeland Security, uh, detection and monitoring, which we have uh, about 106 uh, locations where we provide support. We provide aerial support, about 12,000 hours for detection and monitoring, and we provide intel analysis. JTF North, my Joint Task Force North, provides direct support to enable law enforcement agencies to conduct their mission, to include intel assessments in Mexico, pointing out where the Mexicans can utilize uh, intel assessment to collect precursors, interdict precursors, uh, and also provide support to uh, enable our fo folks here in the Homeland Law Enforcement Agencies to get after the problems now north to south flows, such as interdicting money and uh, also interdicting weapons. But I can't do that directly because that's a law enforcement action. But could the president ask you to do that? The president could ask under special authorities for uh, the military to do more, yes. Yeah, I mean, this is, I mean, this is in pure insanity and a, a testament to the lack of leadership of this president that he's not asking you to do whatever you can to stop fentanyl from flooding into this country. In fact, let me point out that in, tw in 2020, President Trump visited Southcom for a briefing. Specifically, he went to Southcom for a briefing to talk about the campaign against drug trafficking. That's the type of leadership that he provided in this country, the opposite of what we're seeing coming from President Biden. Um, it, it's just, it's, it's, Mr. Chairman, it's just, un, it's unbelievable to me that this president has completely ignored the situation that I, I'm, I'm baffled by it, that the general has not briefed the president of the United States directly and shown that kind of leadership, knowing that he could, as you just said, he could ask you to do more at the border and he's not asking you to do it. There's not a family in my district in Northeast Indiana anymore that I talk to who isn't directly affected by the drug epidemic in this country. And that the President of the United States won't go to his top general in charge of protecting our southern border and stopping drugs from coming in here when he could is just, it's, it's uh, just absolutely, um, it, it's shameful. And uh, I'm, I'm gonna continue to do whatever I can to make sure that we get a president uh, in the White House who pay, who's paying attention to the southern border. So with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Uh, the gentleman from Florida, in fact, is recognized for five minutes. General Van Herc, ever heard of Rice's Whale? Congressman, I have not. I don't blame you. There are only 51 of them. And until 2021, even the Rice's Whale didn't know that it was a Rice's Whale. People thought it was a bird's whale. But now, because in 2021, some scientist believes they found 51 rice's whales off the coast of Florida, right off the continental shelf. 
There's no live fire testing going on right now in the Gulf test range because uh, the renewal process that is required has been queered by the Department of Commerce. Uh, as you well know, the Gulf test range is the only place where we do certain types of exquisite live fire testing. Um, doesn't it seem odd that our country would suspend all of that for 51 whales that are a subspecies of a different whale? Certainly a policy decision. I'm not aware of uh, the, the specifics behind that, but uh, certainly I think the uh, stopping of uh, military testing uh, capabilities uh, to test our weapons could have an impact on our readiness. Yeah, a cascading effect on our readiness, as a matter of fact, because what's happening at Eglin Air Force Base now is that the live fire testing is having to occur over the land range, which is impacting the mission of 6 Ranger Battalion, of 7 Special Forces Group, of the Navy EOD school. It will potentially lead to evacuations of several highways that my constituents use by the thousands every single day. And so what I'm hoping to do is bring a little sanity to this process because a serious nation would not impair live fire testing and other critical testing of hypersonic component parts over this range that this committee has invested about $170 million into because we found 51 whales that we didn't know existed before 2021. Because we share a vision to ensure that we have that high level readiness and that we have the areas necessary to plan for a China scenario, will, will your staff work with me to try to see how we can supercharge the voice of the Department of Defense in this interagency process where some people appear to be stopping critical military mission over 51 whales? Congressman, that's not what my staff would do. I would say the uh, Air Force and the department should work with you on the way forward on that. I'm a consumer of that readiness. I do have concerns about uh, ensuring our forces are ready, but that would not be my responsibility as a combatant commander. Well, will the department work with me on that? Congressman, thank you for highlighting this issue. We're happy to take that question back. Thank you. I really appreciate it because I don't, I don't think a serious country would behave this way. And by the way, we're not the only ones operating in the Gulf of Mexico. China, China was able to purchase from Shell Oil an oil rig where they have dual use capabilities. As a matter of fact, it's called the Ram Powell Unit Platform. Are you familiar with that platform, General Van Hurt? I'm aware of uh, what you're saying with regards to China purchasing uh, an oil rig, I'm not aware of that specific platform. Yeah, so I mean, here's what happened. It, it was astonishing to me that this could occur. In 2016, Shell Oil wanted to sell one of their platforms out in the middle of the Gulf of Mexico where we do all this high-end testing. And the 96 test wing at my military installation objected. They said, please do not, do not create a secret Chinese intelligence gathering platform masquerading as an oil rig in the middle of the Gulf of Mexico. And lo and behold, in 2016, the Obama administration State Department approved it anyway through the CFIUS process. And so like, I just wonder how that happens. I wonder how like when, when the 96 test wing, when the Air Force is saying, bad idea, don't sell this oil rig in the middle of the Gulf of Mexico to China, then the Obama administration green lights it. What advice can you give, what advice can you give me, Ms. Dalton, about how to, ensure that these interagency workings don't lead to a circumstance where Americans are paralyzed in testing and operations in the Gulf because of 51 whales we didn't know existed until 2021, and yet the Chinese are able to go and compromise a platform to gather intelligence on our exquisite testing. Congressman, as, as mentioned, happy to take the, the question back on, on the whales, certainly when it comes to PRC activities in the region, as the three of us have testified today, we are cl closely tracking their investments, their activities, their, their operations, um, including through third parties. Is there anyone who doesn't agree with the statement that we're all better off if the Chinese Communist Party isn't operating dual purpose oil rigs in the Gulf of Mexico? We all agree with that, right? No, one disagree. no one's like, you know what, we need to think twice and maybe be more accommodating to the Chinese. Well, I would say, let's not be so accommodating to the Chinese, let's not be so accommodating to the whales, and let's get back to the great mission that I know you all believe in. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, I, I yield back. I thank the gentleman. Chair uh, now yields to the gentleman from Tennessee, Dr. Desjardins, for any questions he may have. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, General Van Herk, uh, how concerned are you by North Korea's continued missile development and production, and do you believe they presently have the capability to overwhelm our missile defenses of the homeland, or are they nearing that point? Yes, yeah, so I'm uh, 
incredibly concerned about their ability to potentially um, overwhelm my capacity to defend. I, I'd rather talk in a classified session uh, to, about the, the details of that, but absolutely I'm concerned. Okay. Can you describe the benefit that the next generation interceptor could provide in defending against this threat? Absolutely. So the next generation interceptor gives uh, 20 additional uh, ground-based interceptors, which will help me with the capacity that you're alluding to. Uh, so it will give us a total of about uh, 64 or more interceptors, which gives me more uh, opportunities and capacity. In addition to that, uh, the, the uh, next generation interceptor, when coupled with the long-range discriminating radar, will help me against the additional cap uh, capabilities they're developing, such as decoys, uh, to be able to discriminate that. That's really crucial going forward. Yeah. How about placement of additional interceptors in Alaska? Would that be useful? Uh, Capacity-wise, absolutely, as long as they came with uh, the capabilities we're describing. Okay. And uh, finally, earlier in this hearing, you briefly mentioned concern about U.S. defense funding and strategies in the Arctic. I wanted to give you some more time, if you needed, to elaborate on your concerns in this area. Uh, where are the gaps in our Arctic strategy and capabilities, and what do we need to be doing better to compete with China and Russia in this critical regions? Yeah, I would point to last year the uh, National Defense Authorization Act directed me to do uh, Arctic studies. I completed that and turned it in, uh, and it was given to Congress in September. That will give you a classified look at the capabilities we're talking about, but in general I need persistence. That means uh, fuel north of Dutch Harbor, Alaska, infrastructure to operate day-to-day uh, uh, -day in campaigning but also in uh, crisis, uh, and communication capabilities as well so we can communicate not only voice but data as well in the Arctic. Thank you. Yield back. Chair, now recognize the gentleman from Louisiana, Mr. Johnson, for five minutes. <coughs> thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, General Richardson, thank you for your testimony today. Thank all of you for your time. I'm, I'm very concerned about China's uh, influence in our own hemisphere in uh, South America. And it's been widely reported that uh, they've been trying to buy favor through the Belt and Road and other means. And you noted in your testimony that China's trade with Latin America and the Caribbean has increased by 24,000 percent over the last 20 years. So I'm curious um, about your assessment of how successful they've been in using those trade relationships to exert uh, influence in South America, and what are some of the indicators that we should be looking at in measuring that success? So I think that is uh, when, when that enormous amount of trade over a short period of time, um, then that's building uh, trust with the partner nations, I would say. It's also building um, uh, partnering that they are doing with our partner nations. And, and that further um, makes our partners think twice about uh, partnering you know, with us or, or continuing to look that direction towards them. And so I think that plays uh, quite a bit into uh, the relationship dynamics. What are some of the things that we're currently doing to respond to those attempts from China to exert influence in our own, own hemisphere? And, and then moreover, in a perfect world, if you could design a perfect plan, what more would we or should we be doing to push back? Well, it's really to, um, to uh, highlight what uh, we offer and what we're able to do, that we're on the field and being able to give something counter, you know, that there's a, a counter argument to what the Chinese is offering. And that's why I just um, I, I want to uh, talk about loudly. We're on the ground on the military side of the house, but we can do better um, talking about and uh, and advertising the other investments that we have going on in the region as a whole of government approach from Team USA. And, and I heard you earlier, and I, I wish you'd elaborate or explain it one more time. What you mean by putting the flag on more things? I mean, we want to project peace through strength, and part of that is a big part of that is perception, right? Our strength, our resolve. Is that what you mean by that? It is, um, and the uh, the private sector is a very important piece of this, and they're busy at work investing. But um, I would say we could we could we shouldn't be so modest that we should advertise what Team USA is doing uh, through all the instruments of national power. We should be uh, advertising what Team USA is doing because we are uh, much more prevalent in the region than we're given credit for. I love that. You know, Ronald Reagan used to remind us we should paint with bold colors and not pale pastels because weakness invites aggression, and that's, what, in our view, what, what is happening right now. General Van Herc uh, testified a few moments ago uh, to Mr. Banks' questions about uh, the very limited support, obviously, that the uh, Department of Defense is providing at the southern border, and I wanted to ask Secretary Dalton about that just a little bit more. My understanding is that DOD has fewer than 
2,000 National Guard personnel in Title X status deployed to the southern border in support of CBP. And uh, the department is providing uh, UAV support and, and, and some of the other uh, intel assessment, I think. But um, the, the Department of Homeland Security requested the current levels of support. Is that right? Congressman, thank you for the question. Um, so we are actually providing approximately 2,500 um, ground and air personnel in Title X status um, to support DHS in the Southwest Border Mission, as well as 12,100 flight hours. Um, on top of that, um, also aerostat uh, support, um, and also have um, the Secretary's approved contracted reimbursable support for additional air, ground, land, building, and medical support for a surge at the border if that's anticipated in the next few months. Okay, but all the things that have been described is not enough, clearly. We have a catastrophe at the border from our perspective, and I think the evidence speaks for itself. So why hasn't DHS requested more? That's the question. Thank you, Congressman. Um, we are continuing to engage uh, DHS and our other interagency partners on what is an unprecedented challenge at, at the border. Um, as noted, the, the numbers are skyrocketing. Um, we are all very conscientious of the likely lifting of Title 42 in, in May, and there are concerted interagency efforts uh, to get after this, this challenge. As General Van Herc mentioned, um, this is principally a law enforcement function. Um, and so we are strong advocates for fully resourcing the Department of Homeland Security. Good. But for CBP I only have 10 seconds left. Technologies that it, are important. Let me for stop this you. Mission. It's a law enforcement function. But if law enforcement is overwhelmed because of policy choices or otherwise, DOD has to step up. We have to close the border. If we don't have a secure border, we don't have sovereignty, we don't have a nation. I'm out of time. I yield back. Gentlemen, time is expired. Chair now recognizes the gentleman from Guam. And before he starts, I do want everybody to know. Tell all the MLAs for members back in their offices. After Mr. Moyle, and we will recess and move to the to the classified area for the uh, second portion of this hearing. But, gentlemen, recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for our witnesses. Uh, General Van Hurt, yeah, the 2022 Missile Defense Review states an attack on Guam or any other U.S. territory by any adversary will be considered a direct attack on the United States. And goes on to recognize that Guam, an unequivocal part of the United States, and given that Guam is part of the US homeland, in your personal military assessment, General, is Guam defended to an acceptable standard, especially considering that the territory does not fall under the umbrella of NORAD, General? That question is best answered by Admiral Aquilino. What I can tell you is the department's moving forward with an aggressive plan to defend Guam. Missile Defense Agency is working that right now. I look forward to working with the Missile Defense Agency as we build capabilities out to defend the CONUS as well. And thank you, General. And then just in your, in your opinion, could you please highlight some resources that you would feel important to have defending the entire U.S. homeland, including Guam, such as the over-the-horizon radars? Yeah, so the over-the-horizon radars are crucial for domain awareness. Uh, and I um, uh, applaud Congress and the Department for funding those in FY23. Uh, as we go forward, we'll need a little bit more funding. I look forward to seeing the, uh, the budget in 24 as it comes out here. Uh, additional capability, though, is really access to forces that are organized, trained, and equipped to operate throughout my AOR, which includes the Arctic, uh, as well, but not only in the Arctic, but here in the homeland. I'm the only combatant commander that has to go ask for forces that has an area in a time of crisis that I don't have the, uh, the assigned or allocated forces. And I don't need them assigned or allocated as long as I have access to those to defend the homeland. I need additional domain awareness for undersea capabilities. Uh, the, the Russians, as you're probably likely aware, not only have now their uh, most capable submarines in the Atlantic, uh, they'll have them in the Pacific as well, and that's going to present challenges. And uh, the PRC is about uh, uh, eight to ten years behind them. So the problem is only going to grow from a homeland domain awareness perspective and also in the cyber domain. We need more capabilities to understand where we're vulnerable across not only DOD and our federal entities, but across the nation as a whole uh, in the cyber domain. Thank you, General, for all you do, and thank you to the witnesses. Mr. Chairman, thank you. I yield back. I thank the gentleman. Chair will... Uh be uh, reconvening in 2212 at 1245. This hearing is adjourned.